on a blistering hot afternoon in South Africa, another cloudless day. The animals of Juma seeking the only refuge, one of the only refuges they can find from this extreme heat and from the effects of the drought. Juma Pan, where everybody has learned to share and share alike, except for that guy. He hasn't quite learned that lesson. Welcome. My name is Jamie. I have Brian on camera with me this afternoon. James is out with Rusty with Andrew. We've started off our afternoon. It is incredibly warm, as I said. It's, in theory, 36 degrees centigrade, which is 96 in Fahrenheit. That is in theory. Brian and I strongly disagree. We think that the real feel, and this is true, actually, in the sun with the pressure and the humidity, the real feel is put it somewhere around 44 degrees centigrade, which is at least over 105 degrees Fahrenheit, probably close to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So really a boiling hot afternoon. Welcome, we are coming to you live, as I said, from Juma and Arethusa Game Reserves within the Sabi Sands, our little portion of the Greater Kruger area in South Africa, so the northeastern corner of South Africa. Not only are we live, but we are also interactive. So if you have any questions that you'd like to feed through, or comments even that you'd like to make, you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And we do love to hear from you. Let us know if you are joining us for the first time. Oof, this poor hippo is really starting to feel the effects of the drought. And Tim, in theory, Tim is a new viewer watching on YouTube. He wants to know where are we going to drive today. In theory, I think that for James and myself, our rough plan is to move between shade spot to shade spot. We did briefly consider the option of a non-stop safari, given the heat, because that gives us at least a bit of a wind chill factor. But Tim, the joys of a live safari is that you never really know exactly where you're going. As it happens, I think I'm going to pop down to the south eastern corner of Juma. There was reports of Tingana, a big dominant male leopard. We had a water buck killed just 50 meters to the south of that junction. I'm hoping that he might decide to grace us with his presence. But as our regular viewers will know, nothing really goes according to plan. I'm also hoping that some of our water holes might present us with enjoyable elephant sightings. Not much else is moving in the heat of the day, although leopards tend to break that rule on a fairly regular basis. You have to feel a little bit for these animals, struggling to get by with the access to water that they have. That terrapin, though, has found the perfect resting place. He's decided to seat himself on the hippo. This Hippo needs, I think, to start considering moving across to Sydney's dam. He's losing condition like this for a couple of reasons. One is he is constantly in the sun. The pan is not deep enough for him to be completely submerged. Two, the other hippos are fighting him during the night. There's a lot of conflict over access to water as our water holes decrease every day. And three, there's not much in the way of grazing material at the moment. The content isn't fantastic. Now, I said earlier that it was share and share alike at the waterhole. I'm very sad because about 20 seconds before we went live, there was a stunning water monitor lizard. He was originally drinking in the fresh patch of water where the pumped water feeds into the pan. He was having a drink and a rest there. And as soon as we arrived, he scuttled off into the pan, did a long swim around, bopped his nose on a floating piece of log, and then, here we go, perfect, thank you, Brian. That piece of log that we weren't sure whether it was a terrapin or not. And then climbed out on the opposite bank, disappearing under a crevice under a log, where I think he's gone to hide out in the shade. Water monitors not quite having the bright colors of the rock monitor legobarns. That's the South African name for the monitor lizard, is a legobarn. I think it's time for us to move on, although I'm quite reluctant to leave our wonderful patch of shade, but I do think it's time for us to move on. Let's go and look for Tingana. In the meantime, let's find out what James's plans are for this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sizzle Safari on this, the 13th of February, 
the year of our Lord, 2016. Now, it is apparently about 35 to 36 degrees centigrade, 91 to 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Good grief, it feels a lot hotter than that. It feels like it's about 7,000 or so, just like that. Perhaps you might feel if swimming in a live volcano. That is why I'm speaking with a great slowness. My mind is boiling within my head and therefore not functioning at the speed it once did. That is a water buck. And that is a very clever water buck, of course, because it is sat standing in the shade. My name is James Hendry, in case you're a new viewer. And if you are a new viewer, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for giving us of your time. And may I ask that you give us your questions and your comments too. Here comes the water buck now. And on camera today, we've got Andrew Francis in his camouflaged hat, dark glasses, Sennheiser earphones. He's really rigged up. And, um... If you want to talk to us, hashtag Safari Live on the Tweet Tweet or questions at wildearth.tv on the email. Now, I'm going to be silent for a little while and I want you try, to try and appreciate, try and sort of, in fact, try and remove yourself from whatever seat you're sitting on at the moment, wherever you happen to find yourself in the world. Try and remove yourself to an experience here where there is a very dry heat covering your body, you're starting to sweat but you are sitting in the shade, and now listen carefully and take a deep breath in and try and smell what I'm smelling. I'm going to be quiet for the next 15 seconds. Right. Now, what I would like you to do, if you don't mind, those of you who feel like it, send us through in three words, or three, three or less words, just the feeling that you got there. Because there's a complete silence here. There's no noise at all, except for the odd buzzing of a fly, and just as the odd gentle zephyr touches the top of the trees, you can hear a slight rustling of the wind. Otherwise, everything is completely silent. The birds are huddling in the shade. You can see the mammals are doing the same thing. That water buck thinks I'm off my head. <laughs> and the final control, which is, of course, being blessed today by Kirsty and Jerry, thinks of the same thing. So, my plan this afternoon, and therefore your plan, unless you tell me any different, because it is, after all, your game drive, as much as it is, as it is mine, is to go to Treehouse Dam initially, Then I think we might pop on to Arethusa, see what's going on there. Very little was going on there this afternoon, but they do have some water there. And I think popping from water point to water point to start with today is a good idea. The wild dogs were on Simbambili earlier, so when we wind our way out of Arethusa, we'll probably head towards Sydney's dam. And we'll use the super zoom camera here to get a picture perhaps of that huge crocodile that I'm convinced I saw there yesterday. And um, many people think that that was a hippo. I am unconvinced, but it might have been a hippo. And with any luck, those wild dogs will hunt somewhere between One Eye Pan in Simbambili and Sydney's dam in Biffles Hook. And that particular area, it will be rich in impala and warthog and other things that wild dogs like to eat. And with any luck, we'll be able to see them. So that's the general plan. Let's um, leave this water buck to himself and his very clever spot here in the shade. And we'll press on towards Simbambili. I'm going to go via Treehouse Dam. There is still one puddle of water there, fed by an underground flow of water in the drainage line that feeds the dam. And there might be something having a drink there, perhaps a warthog boar, perhaps a lonely elephant.
So, Diana, thank you very much. You've got a, three words for me to describe what we were feeling there. You said peaceful and silent. Silent and peaceful. Look, Andrew, there's a kudu having a wee. Now, this is the closest I've ever got to a kudu here, and I think it's simply because we've caught her mid-flow, as it were. Uh, thank you, Stephen. You say tranquility and paradise. Obviously not for the kudu here, for the feeling that we got when we were sitting looking at the water buck. I think that's a very good way of putting it. Tranquility and paradise. Now, Kudu, obviously, is a browser, you can see. Eats leaves off trees rather than grass. Found herself a little sapling that has managed to, obviously, tap into some underground water and has put up a number of beautiful green shoots. I don't think that's going to last long at a verdant green colour like that. I think it's going to be devoured. Oh! I don't know what freaked her out. You can see the tail there. You see how the tail flicks up towards the back? And there's a white patch underneath, like a white, long white pom-pom. And if she's alarmed, she'll stick it all the way up. And she's obviously slightly alarmed, so it's halfway up. And they know exactly from where they're being observed. And so often, just like with the ground hornbill we had this morning, she's walked behind a tree to put herself between us and the tree, at least to put the tree between her and us, simply so that she can feel like she's got a bit of cover. Even though her head is turned away from us, of course, their eyes are in the sides of their heads, and that means that they can see pretty much, well, not, if it's not 360 degrees, it's straight in front to all the way around there. It's probably about 270 degrees, so far further around their heads than we can or any of the predators can. As we know, that comes with sacrifices. And the sacrifice to having eyes like that, which are brilliant security detectors, the sacrifice to that, of course, of that they don't have binocular vision. So they cannot judge distance effectively with their eyes. The way you judge distance from one point to another is because your eyes focus onto it together and that gives you an impression that allows you to be able to judge a distance. Birds do it quite often, have binocular vision, quite impressive binocular vision, as do most of the predators. But apparently a lot of these herbivores don't have very sophisticated binocular vision at all. So it is hot, but it's not as hot as I thought it was going to be. It doesn't feel quite as boiling as it was. <laughs> I think in it in connect Connecticut, where I believe it is uh, probably freezing cold at the moment, your three words are peace, earth, and toasty. Was that, is that what you heard? Peace, earth, and toasty. Thank you, Enid. It certainly is toasty. It's probably more roasty than toasty, but certainly. Thank you, Enid. Just some wispy clouds about the place. There were a few thunderheads coming up over the mountains, but I don't think they're going to give us anything today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Wonderful wild kingdom was your answer to the three words when we were looking at the water buck at the beginning. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And thank you to all of you who've sent through answers. We, don't, we can't read them all out because there's so many. So thank you very much for that. And I hope whatever those words were for you, you are able to absorb them and take them in as we go through the drive. And perhaps we'll do something similar at the end when it cools down a bit. And perhaps you'll have a slightly different impression of things. Right, we're heading towards the waterhole here, and there are a few impala about the place. And these impala... will 
will be not too far from the water. I think they'll probably find that they are utilizing this little puddle at Treehouse Dam quite extensively. That one, you can see curved horns, born probably November 2014. So just over a year old, easy to age until they get to about three years old and then it becomes almost impossible because their horns don't change shape. Very nice, thank you, Andrew. And just as we go under this marula tree, just look at the leaves and the way they are wilting. And we talk a lot about the herbivores struggling in the drought. We talk a lot about the advantages that it brings to the carnivores. And Lisa on Twitter, you want to know what about the invertebrates, the spiders, and especially the golden orbweb spiders. Well, I can comfortably tell you what's going on with them. They're not having a good time of it. I've seen one golden orbweb spider this year, and that was on the walk the other day. It was a little female like that. I mean, of course, they get up to about that size. But this was a little female. And they're not around. Look, I said there might be a warthog there. There he is. Unfortunately, he's running off, poor fellow. Obviously disturbed him. Sorry, chap. He didn't like our discussion. Didn't want to be caught by the water. <laughs> I love that tail. It's just so wonderful. <laughs> Right. So the golden orbweb spiders, of course, are totally dependent on water. I'm not sure why, but probably because of the number of insects that they need to eat are dependent on water as well. So only one golden orbweb spider where normally you'll find them strewn through every sort of available tree. There will be a golden orbweb spider weaving or spinning a beautiful golden orb web. Not this year. We'll just drive on to the dam wall. <coughs> and you can see perhaps a little bit of the moisture where that warthog was reclining. There it is. Just inside there. So underground water flowing along what is this sort of dry drainage line and dug there. That hole was dug by elephants. It's probably not producing enough water at the moment for the elephants to bother drinking from it. And so it's a well used piece of real estate for things like impala and warthog and other small animals. I'm sure Diker come down and Stienbock come down to have a drink every so often, possibly when there's, in the very heat of the day, when the chances of being spotted by a predator are very small. As far as I understand it, Jamie is off in the southeast of the reserve looking perhaps for tracks of Tingana coming across onto Juma. That would be marvelous. Let's go and find out from her what she's managed to find. Looking for tracks of Tingana and also checking all of the deep shady patches around. One thing I have noticed just just from that drive from the pan down to our southern boundary is just how quiet the birds are. Even they are seeking refuge in the shadowy parts of the thicker bushes to try and stay cool. And as a result, there's not really, apart from the odd rattling cysticular call, <clears throat> there's not really even one peep from them. And quite often in a midwinter's afternoon, they'll chirp all the way through the day. You'll hear them Yes, there's definitely an increase in the dawn chorus, so the songs that they sing in the morning, and the songs that they sing in the afternoon or late evening. But you'll hear them pretty much throughout the day, whereas at this time of year, oh dear, Brian, we're going to be um, consuming dust. 
I'm just going to hover here for a second. I'm not quite sure what to do. If we stay still in the sun, we boil. If we don't, we eat dust. Oh no, there's another one. Oh no. This appears to be the main source of all traffic. I've timed my arrival very badly. I'm just going to let them go ahead. They seem to be on quite something of quite a mission. Makes sense to just let them go further. Has it? Smile or what? <laughs> can, can you see my tummy's been held in? <laughs> How's it? Uh, Cheers. The line. Um, no, we haven't seen them. Not on our side, but apparently Tingana was around the Gauri Main Cheetah Cup line. Cool. Enjoy. Okie dokie. Onwards. Raj, I was chatting a little bit about birds and their bird choruses and all of the noise that they make. Sorry, Brian. I'm going to be sneezing all the way through the drive. I know what we'll do. Let's take a trip up the Mawati first, enjoy a little bit of the shade, find what we can there, and then we'll go back and check for Tingana's tracks once the, the dust has all settled. We can approach it from a slightly different direction. No real harm done. I had no particular reason for taking this route. So birds and their dawn chorus and their calls. I learned something really interesting this afternoon whilst I was cooling off in the swimming pool and reading a book, a textbook about birds. That are really, really good mimics of the other birds. Things like drongos, robin chats, all of those bird species. And they've often fooled, they're, they're potentially good enough to fool even the best birder, even the most astute with an ear for the different calls, may get them mixed up. And it's an interesting one because we've talked before about brood parasitism. So birds like the cuckoos or the honeybirds laying their eggs in a host species nest allowing them to put all of the effort into raising their chicks. Apparently one of the defense mechanisms against that is those imitating bird calls. They can actually imitate the sounds of a cuckoo. So basically around their nest, they imitate the sound of say a Deirdre's cuckoo or a Jacobin or whatever particular bird happens to parasitize their nests and thereby actually intimidate them and stop them from moving into the area and reduce the risk that they're going to nest inside there, go and nest inside them. And interestingly, if we look at these holes in the side of the wall here, and I know we've spoken before multiple times about them, these nesting sites, they haven't been occupied this year as far as I know, and usually utilized either by bee eaters or kingfishers. And just since we're here and we're chatting about them, we're not going to stay still for too long because otherwise Brian and myself might cook. But you get the rough idea excavated holes in the walls, tunnels that then dip down slightly into the sandy wall itself, constructed by bee eaters and kingfishers, and a safe, secure place to lay their eggs, you would think. But there are certain species of cuckoo, since we are talking about the different ways in which they are either successful or unsuccessful, that imitate those, uh, or go into those nest holes and lay their eggs there. Now most species of cuckoo have to imitate the type of egg or the look of the host species egg. For example, the Deirdrix cuckoo is famous for it. You can imitate up to four different eggs, from the little blue robin eggs to the speckled weaver's nest or weaver's eggs, anything along those lines. But for the cuckoos that parasitize those birds that nest in tunnels, you actually don't need to. to Africa if you're feeling particularly warm. I'll stop at the spur file just, just so that we've got something to... Actually, it's quite fun watching the waves nav whoop, navigating the pathway. They're fascinating little birds. Here's that other one gone. So 
I think it's just going to reappear. Mattel Franklins, or Mattel Spurfowls, as they're now known. My apologies. And their little constant cheaping contact calls. They've got the right idea. Occupying the Mawati drainage line. And in fact, in this open patch, we've also got the wind as well as the shade. Perfect spot to be. I think, in fact, those cars did us a favor. Hey, Brian? This is the place to be on a hot afternoon. What was I chatting about? Oh, yes. I was chatting about the weather because Donna wanted to know what the weather's like in August. And actually, Donna, it's one of my favorite times of year, right up to sort of September, October, the end of the winter period. The nights are still a little bit chilly in the early morning, so if you're planning on a trip in August, Donna, it is a wonderful time to come. Your game viewing is incredible. It's still cool enough that you've got a chance of seeing the mysterious nocturnal creatures coming out a little bit earlier, or maybe going back to bed a little bit later. And at the same time, it's warm enough that you could actually, in the middle of the day, put your swimming costume on and go for a quick dip in the lodge pool. So August weather is lovely. It's a lovely time to be in the bush. One of my favorites. I think September actually comes up close as well. There's nothing like the shade of these giants. I know that Brent did a very interesting demonstration this morning where he sat on the tracker seat of the car and didn't drive itself. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to sit and look up at the beautiful trees that are keeping us in their shade. These gentle giants, the jackalberry tree that you're looking at at the moment. One of my favorite things to do, drive through these drainage lines. While I, am, <laughs> while, while I am complaining, not complaining, just updating you as to what the temperature currently feels like, a lot of you have been sending through your updates about how warm or how cold, for the most part, it is. Thank you, guys. It gives us a really interesting perspective on the way in which our different viewers are experiencing the weather outside their front doors. And for us, we sometimes forget, and often I've complained of being chilly, and then remembered quite clearly that some of our viewers definitely have not experienced or do not think that the temperatures I think are cold are actually cold. So it always gives you a very interesting glance into other people's lives. At this point, I'm so adapted to sitting in hot temperatures that anything, as soon as the mercury dips below about 20, which I think is about 74, 25, which is about 74 degrees or 75 degrees Fahrenheit. As soon as that temperature dips below that, I'm freezing and I need a jacket. And I know that some of you have hit minus temperatures, a freezing, I'm not sure. Conversion in Fahrenheit is not my greatest. I've heard tell of 18 degrees Fahrenheit in certain states. And thick piles of snow. Oopsie be a concentrated bit better. Sorry, Brian. Have a russet bush willow. Now, that is actually something I meant to update you on, and I completely forgot, and my sincere apologies is a question that came from Tammy about where are the Birmingham boys? Has the drought kept them near better water holes? What's going on? Why haven't we seen them in a little while? Tammy, I meant to update you. My apologies. There are a couple of Birmingham boys we think on a kill just to the south of Weaver's Nest, just to the south of where we are. And there's a couple more towards the Encoro side. Apparently, um, Brent was at a rangers meeting this afternoon, and apparently there was a run-in between the Nkurumas and the Sticks at some point last night, and the Sticks fled further to the west whilst the Nkurumas stayed around in Coral. That is the word on the street, so to speak, or the road on the word on the dirt road would probably be more appropriate. Might, be, might have needed to turn the steering wheel there. And Tammy, in terms of why we haven't seen them, and if, if it's because they're at better water, the answer, the answer is no, not really. This is fairly typical lion behavior. With the, uh, we're seeing it with the Talamatis as well in Buffleshook and the Salati males in Buffleshook. They don't have to go 
know all that far away to catch the animals that are coming to the dam. So they're sticking around in what they consider to be the core part of their home ranges. The Nkumas have moved around a little bit recently, for which we are very grateful because it allowed us to see them for a couple of days and have some wonderful views. But it's not that unexpected for lions during a drought period to stick very closely to a fairly familiar area. Now, I, we do know every now and again we pick up on the Birmingham's track, so they do still come into Juba. Oh, that's very bright. Um, so they come into Juma and then they cross back out again. Why it is that they've decided maybe they just don't feel like Juma needs to be defended as closely as our southern boundary. I love this archway. It's so beautiful. It's almost like it's an entrance to the Mawati. Definitely one of my favorite things. It's a russet bush willow that is curved over and made a sort of a what would you call it? I guess a gabled arch would be the accurate representation. You don't need to switch off though. Natural archway for us to go under. Interesting. Very cool. It also means that Brian has to drop down our antenna. We don't actually fit under that unless we do. So Tammy, in terms of the Birmingham boys, one other option is that Within their southern boundary, their biggest threats are, for example, the Salati males, who are large and very healthy. Well, one of them's got an injured foot. They're two big males up in that direction. There's also, oh, so to the north, sorry. Whereas to the south, along that Mala Mala border and further along, there's always a bigger threat. And I've noticed there's a lot more vocalization that comes from the male lions in the south. So, for example, the Charleston males around that sort of area. It seems as though they're a bit more vocal, a bit more defensive of their territories. Obviously, that plays a factor as well in terms of where the Birmingham boys go. So they like to, they, they pick where they feel their weakest boundary is and then they patrol along that. And that way, work to keep their territory safe. Obviously, they don't feel the same amount of threat from the Salati males in their northern boundary. And I'm, I must say, I hardly ever hear the Salati males vocalizing at night. That vocalization is an all-important part of the interaction between the different males and the way in which they maintain their territorial boundaries without necessarily having to come to a physical confrontation at any point. So I think it's a combination of factors. That plus the Unkahuma female being an estrus, and that was the Styx female before that, also has a tendency to keep a lion within a slightly more restricted home or restricted area males and the males don't move around as much or nearly as much and the other males even if they aren't mating with her will stick close to you in case they get the opportunity to do so. Whilst Brian and myself continue along our Mwati drainage line tour let's pop over to James find out what he's been up to. Look at that beautiful picture of a yellow billed hornbill. Sorry, 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 everybody. That was the game drive radio. Thankfully, the hornbill didn't take offence, and you can hear him calling. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that the most beautiful sound? And the beak is open like that, not just for the call. The beak is open, of course, because birds pant, just like many mammals do. And it's a, called a gula flutter. And you can see the throat, you can see his throat there puffing away. You can see his tongue. Oh, that's wonderful. Can you see the throat pumping up and down? Now, inside the throat, it's just like our throats. It's quite moist, but in the throat of a bird like that, there's a lot of vein and arterial blood flowing through there so that it can cool down as the bird pants and that can then go to the brain and cool down the most important part of the body. Look at the eyes. Isn't that amazing? And I don't know if any of you were watching this morning, but we had that incredible sighting of a ground hornbill 
a relative, and not a very close relative, but relatively close relative of the yellow-billed hornbill. And you can see that it, this one too has those red wattles underneath the beak. Oh, what a wonderful sighting, that's brilliant. Fantastic. There are also some waterbuck here. I'm just going to sneak a little bit forward. This one is a waterbuck cow. She is hiding behind a small leaf, thinking that she's either invisible or too hot to give a damn. It's quite possibly the latter. It does feel unspeakably hot, and I must say, of course, in the next two days, it's going to get even hotter. We have a prediction of 40 degrees Celsius, which is about 105 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's for Monday. Anyway, we'll see what happens. But so still today, so completely still. And now that that bird has stopped going, So, there is no sound at all. Hmm. Now, Andrew, would you just go off to that? Can you see the, the spider web? Yes. See that? Hello, Colleen. You're watching with your husband, Jason. And that spider's web has got absolutely nothing to do with what you're asking, but it does have to do with a query we had about golden orb web spiders. That is not a golden orb web spider. It looks a little bit like it is the beginnings of a community web spider, but even they will be struggling in the absence of lots of insects for them to eat. So a very scraggly example of a spider's web and a particularly impressive spider when it has built a home that yeah, sort of is. And sorry, I'm just waiting for a name that's coming through. Kirsten, key your microphone a little bit longer because we're on Arethusa, if you don't mind. There we go. It was Lisa who was asking about the golden orb web spiders. And so, Lisa, that is a spider web for you. Now, Colleen, you are watching with your husband for the first time. And he wants to know, has there ever been a time where we've gone out and it's been so hot that we've been worried we might create a spark driving along that might in turn create a fire in the bush? Now, I'm going to... These waterbuck are going to have to move away slightly. Well, they're not going to have to, but they're going to choose to. And I want to show you something. It's a very good question. Now, the thing about when it's hot here is that normally it's also wet. And so the chances of there being a fire are very small in the summertime because it's normally very wet and normally the grass is quite high. But if you look across here now, no amount of flame or spark is, is going to set a fire through here. There's simply nothing to burn. And out here, the flames would take maybe some of that dry grass there, but there's just nothing for it to burn. No flame. Sorry, are you losing me, Andrew? Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry, everybody. How's that? Better? Yeah. Okay. So no flame is ever going to be able to rush through here. No flame will be able to take any of the trees without the trees having a lot of grass underneath them. So what happens is, in a very wet season, the grass sward grows up. In an area like this, you'd find that the grass would be round about this high after a proper growth season. And then we'd go into the subsequent dry season, so September, October time. And then, if there was to be a spark or something large, like a lightning strike in the September, September or October, then it would burn. And so the chances of it burning in summer when it's hot are very, very small indeed. And I mean, I would be more than happy to take a box of matches and throw that into the bush. It might burn a little patch and then it would go again. September, October, when there's a bit of wind, the grass is still high and we get lightning strikes. That's the kind of major fire season. But now, heat like this with no grass, no, I wouldn't be worried in the slightest about driving along and causing any kind of fire. Nice question. Thank you for that very much. Sorry, Andrew, I will remember next time to place the aerial in an acceptable position. Yes. 
Right, we're heading towards Arethusa Dam. It's not too far from here. Let's see what is there. For the last two days, there have been two magnificent elephant bulls and a young elephant bull. Ooh, now Tony in London, you want to know when I last saw a caracal. Tony, I've never seen a caracal here. And I think the last time I saw a caracal was probably, I'm just trying to think, probably at, at Angala, which is a, no, it would have been at Londolozi down south of here. Uh, but mm, almost 10 years ago, they're not common here. They're very common in South Africa in the middle parts of the country around the Karoo, uh, possibly into the Eastern Cape. They're much more common. And they're certainly, I mean, in some areas where there's sheep farm and goat farmers, they become real stock uh, thieves. So they're a bit of an issue there. But in these areas, they're extremely secretive because, of course, they're way down on the predator hierarchy and they will be wanting to avoid as many predators as possible. And the last time I actually saw a picture of a caracal, it had been caught by a leopard. A leopard will see a caracal as fair game and very happily take it out and, try and eat it. And then today, while on the subject of sort of rare cats, I had to go out in the middle of the day to go and GPS a few things. Ooh, there's a big elephant to go and GPS a few things for a new repeater tower that we're putting up. And I saw a serval in the middle of the day. It was the most magnificent thing. It exploded out of the shade of a marula tree and ran away. I didn't get a picture of it, but there, oh, there's another elephant there, Andrew. We are now surrounded by three elephants. It's wonderful. Now, let me stop here. I wonder if this isn't one of the same herds that we saw yesterday. Let's try and get a handle on it. Not... Oh, there's a very little one up ahead. And I'm going to leave these ones just to sneak forward a bit. And I'm just going to stop there to start with so that you can see the little one before we get too close to him. He's already obviously eating bush, not just milk. Probably still suckling. But will slowly be weaning on the solids, as it were. In fact, this is quite a decent sized herd of elephants. So three or four behind us, and probably another five or six in front in various parts of the bush around here. And he's sweet. He's just smelling us. Totally relaxed at the moment. The wind is blowing slightly towards him, so he'll be picking up our scent, but obviously not very worried about it and probably not worried about us because his mother, who is grazing just to the, or browsing just to the right hand side there, is not reacting to us. Were she to react, were she to give a signal, a low infrasonic rumble, he would definitely respond, go to her, and they might move off but because she seems to be totally relaxed, so the little one is too. And as I've said before, the elephants at this time of the year would normally be grazing. They'd normally be pulling grass instead of trying to eat leaves off trees like that little elephant is trying to do now. Instead of wrapping that trunk around leaves, he'd be wrapping them around it around grass and then eating that, but that's just not possible at the moment. And you can see how that trunk, even at that age, I think that elephant is probably about 18 months old, maybe a little bit younger than that. And you can see still the trunk is not particularly competent at picking up things to eat. So he's kind of pushing the, or pulling the leaves off the tree, dropping them on the ground, and then picking them up from there. With that prehensile tip and prehensile means like a hand, basically, like fingers. Seems a bit confused by the sheer number of leaves on that Cumbretum bush. Oh. <laughs> what, a, what a fantastic shot. There's Mum. Sure, she's putting herself between the baby and us. Maybe it is an element of that. Maybe just that lovely green tree that she wants to devour. 
You'll find every so often also what they do is you saw her there put her trunk in her mouth. And that's a function of the fact that she will be interpreting. I'm just going to turn the virtual reality rig on now. She will be re interpreting signals, olfactory signals in the air and touching them into her mouth so that she can push them into what we call the vemoronasal organ, which is the organ of Jacobson. And that's the organ that all of animals out here have that helps them to interpret the different smells that they have. We have a kind of vestigial virgin, version thereof, but we don't use our olfactory senses nearly as much as an elephant. So when she puts her trunk into her mouth and there's nothing in it, you can almost be sure that she's had a smell at something and she wants to try and interpret it. So I'm just going to point out for the VR rig here what we're looking at. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? So to the left, a beautiful elephant cow walking past just in front of her there. Her calf is coming. And to the left, uh, to the right, a whole lot of other elephants just grazing through the woodland here. Here comes the little calf. Focusing on the same species, that's quite interesting. So the calf has stopped at the same two species of tree. It's a red bush willow tree, obviously something that is quite tasty to the calf. To us, very much full of tannins, not very nice to eat. And I suspect maybe why he's not making a huge effort to pick up too many of those leaves. Probably still having a bit of a suckle now and then. And so not... <laughs> that's wonderful. Look at it, isn't that brilliant? He's almost playing, he just doesn't seem to be making a particularly um, strong effort to eat that tree. And there's a green thorn or torchwood next to us about to take a bit of a hammering. It's certainly not going to be the first hammering that that tree's taken. And the mother there is very selectively taking the new shoots. She's, look at that. She's not pulling the whole branch off. She's taking the very, very newest shoots off the top of the tree. Look at that. That's amazing. Now, you'll find that the chemical composition in the younger leaves will probably be very different from those in the old, from that in the older leaves, probably less in the way of tannin or some, be some other chemical that she is sensing. I've never seen that before. See that? She could easily just break off that whole thing and stuff it in her mouth, but she's taking very specific parts of the tree. That's fascinating. That really is interesting. You can see she's a bit wet. She's obviously been in the Arethusa Dam. We're not far from there at all. Here comes the little one. was just me sinking the VR rig. Don't think we'll use that shot. Susan, you are in New York, where it is very cold, very chilly. I'm just going to reverse a little. And you want to know why there are no big tuskers in the Sabi sands. Susan, there are very few big tuskers left anywhere in South Africa. And that is simply a function of the fact that They've been shot out, basically. Their genes have been shot out of the area. There are one or two, well, there have been a few in the last few years. There, was the, there were seven bulls in the Kruger, known as the Magnificent Seven for a long time. The last of them is now dead. And their genes will still be in the population, but they will be few and far between that you will see bulls enormous. Oh, look at that. There goes the tree. So Susan, big tuskers, 
We see one or two. We don't see those enormous bulls with their, you know, they kind of leave plow marks as they walk along the place. Because their genes, I'm afraid, have just been shot out of the population. But that was a long time ago. Ah, now back onto the sort of story of tusks. Monique, you're in London and you want to know about the tusks on the female there and whether they are stubby or not, if there's something wrong with them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them, Monique. Those are normal. They, you'll find that elephants have tusks that grow in all sorts of different directions, some sideways, some frontwards, some downwards, some all over the place. And that's just Roy going past in his land cruiser with his guests. And so it's not unusual to find a cow with tusks like that. The difference between male and female tusks is the kind of thickness. And normally a female's tusks will grow down towards the ground, but you can see very clearly that hers are growing outwards, a bit like a bull's tusks. And that's not unusual. She's got pretty normal tusks out here. I, we do see that one female who I think the Twitterverse has dubbed Fang, which is not a very nice name. She's got a very long recurved tusk that comes back and looks like it might stab her in the knee every time she walks. And that would be far more unusual than the tusks that this elephant has. She's not young, well, she's not old. I would put her at about 25 to 30 years old. And so the size of her tusks and shape has got nothing to do with her age as such. Applegate, you say you love watching the babies because they're so clumsy and curious. Yes, they are. Isn't it wonderful? I'm just going to whisper quietly here. This is unusual behavior for a cow. She's now less than three feet from us. This is the most spectacular experience. And interestingly, just as Chris was saying that, you know, it's the cow that's come and had a look at us. But completely unlike with a bull, she hasn't come to kind of look. She's just ignoring us and going past so that she can eat. It's wonderful. She was less than three feet from us. Andrew, how are you feeling? Feeling good. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> and elephants have a way of communicating with us, a way I feel that is well, I mean, it's definitely sixth sense sensory. It might be, well, you can call it telepathy, you can call it whatever you like. I didn't feel any sense of threat from this elephant as she walked past us. Did you, Andrew? Uh, no, no. Uh, Not like the big bull, though, Exactly. The big bull was kind of a, he was definitely approaching us to look. But this cow had absolutely no interest to us. She, we just happened to be kind of in the way of where she wanted to go. And I'll watch carefully for the baby and see when he comes and see how closely he's prepared to come towards us. If she does feel uncomfortable with us, she will warn us. Well, normally. This is really cross, but clearly she isn't. Oh, what a lovely question. As this little youngster comes towards us, I'm going to be very quiet. And then, James Richard, I will answer your question about how sensitive I think animals are to our emotions. Oh, this is just, this is too much. Hello, little fellow. You want to know if your question is just anthropomorphic. 
are you anthropomorphizing animals by saying that or asking if they are sensitive to our emotions or not? I don't believe so at all. I think animals are tremendously sensitive to our emotions. You have only to have owned a cat or a dog to know that. And I know that for a long time in science it was very unfashionable to ascribe human emotions to animals and to kind of intimate that there could be some kind of extra sensory communication and by, by extra i mean th through some kind of channel that we don't necessarily understand i don't believe that to be the case and i used to believe it was the case i'm utterly convinced that these animals pick up on our emotions they pick up on our state of mind they pick up on our uh, basically our energy and i know that if i'm in in an angry mood elephants won't approach like that they won't they'll, they'll move away they'll move around They'll lift their heads and look like this. And if you're feeling peaceful, nine times out of ten, they will just ignore you and get on with it. I think it's just astonishing to see and to watch. And I think going forward, research will sh eventually be able to show exactly what that communication is and, and how to describe it. Because I'm obviously making a bit of a hash of describing it. But that's just... that's. I'm convinced that there is some kind of communication there. I'm not going to follow them through there. We've had a beautiful sighting of them. I don't want to make a noise. So let's go down to the water and see if there's anything there. Wasn't that just spectacular? Right, while we're on our way there, let's head across to Jamie, see how her progress with Tingana's tracks are, and I'll catch up with you a little later. Oh, one of my favorite creatures to spend time with is elephants, but we've also got some really stunning antelope here before they disappear into the depths of the shade of the guari bushes. And this thick, dense vegetation leaves that she's just wandered behind. I know that you were having a conversation with James about fires and bushfires, and I know he gave a demonstration. However, if there is a situation where there is a fire, this is the sort of bush that is your friend out here in the felt because first of all it, it keeps its leaves throughout the year so it's evergreen secondly it's got quite nice dense foliage with thin leaves that never become too dry or crispy and the reason that is useful in a fire season is because it works really well as a fire beater that is one of the best uses of the magic quarry it's also thought to be one of the same reasons that lions often spray or scent mark lions and leopards scent mark on that particular tree in order to because that vegetation seems to hold the scent ever so slightly another theory and that is that it is because they spray on those bushes because other animals don't tend to feed on them that much although i have to confess I don't think that any self-respecting herbivore, unless it's absolutely desperate, is going to feed where a lion or a leopard has just scent marked. Their sense of smell is strong enough that they're not going to go nibbling there. And it seems as though we've been driving the entire eastern corner of Juma and all of these antelope species are desperately seeking out the thicker bushes for the shade that they can utilize. Mother Anyala. I'm just going to grab a piece of quarry bush. This is not the best example. I'm trying to find you a nice patch of guari. This will do. Since we're here, I'm going to do this on while we drive, but I just wanted to show you exactly what those leaves look like up close. And you can imagine how if you pile all of these thick, this is possibly not the best example because it's been munched on by various caterpillar species. But we've chatted before about the uses of the magic guari. So now when you come out on your budding rangers courses or whenever you come out on safari, you can fix in your mind what a guari bush looks like. And of course, there's always the demonstration. I'm not going to do it now because I'm sitting in the sun and I would like to move. But you can utilize them as toothbrushes. We've spoken a bit about that. I think it was yesterday morning. Or was it 
yes, at some point, we chatted a bit about leadwood bark, or leadwood ash being used as a toothpaste, and I said that you can combine that with a guari bush. And the reason why is that you can actually chew it. And it splinters quite nicely to create a sort of a, a bristly type brush. Mm. It's also quite bitter though, as you do. We're chatting a bit about plants, and that is an indigenous plant. Ramona was wondering about the different invasive, spot, invasive plants that we get out here, where they might be most commonly occurring and what kind of effects that they have. And there's quite a few species. One of the most invasive are the combination of lantanas or water hyacinths. And those are the ones that clog up, very often clog up the waterways. All of those water weeds that you see around Arethusa Dam, a lot of those are invasive plants. As well as, I know you were looking at the green stuff, and we've looked at it a couple of times, the sort of green layer covering Bifflesworth Dam after it dried up, that the elephants were absolutely loving. So there are quite a few invasive plant species. However, James has just arrived at Arethusa Dam, and since he's got a nice, clear demonstration, I think it's better to pass that question across to him. But a semi-cold beer after a hot... Hmm? What did she say? I'm not copying her. Why are we not copying her? Just give her a thumb. Just give her a two. Sorry, Kirst. I think it just made sense for him to continue on with that answer. guys it looks as though my earpiece has stopped working so I'm not hearing from final control as clearly as I should be I was in the middle of chatting a bit about Ramona's answer or the, uh, the question that Ramona asked about the different invasive plants and we spoke a little bit about water hyacinth and lantana and the fact that they are quite clearly invasive to the point not just that they outcompete the other water naturally occurring water plants but they also clog up waterways where there should actually be water flow and prevent it from moving. And that in turn incubates things like mosquito larvae and anything like that. And there's also a couple of other plants. Oh, most of the flower species that you see, the star zinnias, a lot of the, um, the string of stars species, the brightly colored flowers, a lot of those are actually alien plants, but they're not really hugely invasive. So they don't cause major problems in certain areas. I know that apparently quarantine last year when there was a lot of rain, quarantine clearings was absolutely blanketed in, I'm not sure if it was star zinnia or one of the red flower species. And that in itself is an interesting, interesting effect that those plants can have. So those are the sort of the main plant species. There's a lot of conservation efforts going into removing those various invasive species and replacing them with indigenous plants. It's amazing the way that different plants have an effect. And there's one major argument that continues throughout the big cities, not so much prevalent here, but the fact that, hello Taxon, I wonder what you're up to. Ah, it's Aubrey. How's it, Orbs? Afternoon, how are you? I'm very well. I hear you had Karula this side. Yeah, I'm going to cross now. Okay, she's still there? <gasps> yes, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we'll um, return to that conversation a little bit later. <laughs> Cheers, guys. <laughs> there was a gasp of, of shock from the back of Aubrey's vehicle, who um, has guessed that Novi. So that was the reason behind that particular reaction. And just to let you know, while we're doing that update about Karula, you heard me speaking to Aubrey, and I know James updated the viewers. Karula was last seen on Torchwood on a baby waterbuck kill. So both Tingana and Karula have killed baby waterbuck in the last few days. And Karula on Torchwood, Tingana just to the south of her. It seems as though James is back up and running, so let's find out what's happening at Arethusa Dam.
sorry about the last time, everybody. We lost communications with Final Control. Not their fault, of course. It was just simply a glitch in the proverbial matrix. Well, we're here at Arethusa Dam. There's a great deal of activity going on, which is magnificent. We've got a sounder of warthogs there grazing upon the calluses on their knees, an elephant bull moving off to the left-hand side of your screen, and then to the right-hand side of your screen, if I get out of your way. We've got some impala down at the dam. There are some, there's a, two elephants, one on the wall, one in the water, and two beautiful kudu bulls coming down to have a drink. And the elephant is just showing his displeasure at those kudu bulls. I'm not sure why he doesn't like them, but they tend to become extremely territorial. I mean, they're not territorial, but they seem to become extremely protective about the water for some reason. And we don't really know why that is, possibly because of the drought, and they're worried that their water resources will be diminished. Quite what those kudu will do to diminish this dam, I'm not really sure but he did open his ears out at them. So I think what we'll do is just ease. I was hoping this elephant might approach us after the warthogs, but he's moving through the bush there. So I think what we'll do is move down towards the water and see about the animals that are drinking there. If we do lose communication with the final control again, it will pre preclude us answering your questions. So I'm sorry about that in advance, but we had a sighting exactly here the other day and it was fine. So let's see what happens now. Let's stop here to start with. So I don't, I'm just going to stop here to start with, simply because I don't want to frighten the kudu away. They're very skittish. And of course, because of the dry conditions, we don't want to have them chased away from the only opportunity for them to drink during the day. Anyway, there are the elephants. They're not put off by us at all. One of them, indeed, there are the kudus. Sorry. The elephant there, Andrew, is scratching his buttocks. Can you see that? And here comes a wildebeest as well. All happening here. I suspect the wildebeest is not alone. Could you coming up behind the wildebeest? Ramona, why are we watching this great hive of activity and not really knowing where to point the camera because it's all happening here? You want to know about invasive vegetation and what kind of invasive vegetation do we get here? Well, you're looking at some at the moment. The water hyacinth in here is an invasive plant or certainly an exotic plant. Now remember, we need to differentiate between an invasive plant and an exotic plant. So an invasive plant is, is an exotic that takes over natural areas like this water hyacinth has. It becomes completely out of control in some water areas and I mean you can see that it's covered the surface of this water rendering it fairly ineffective and it will be drinking a lot of the water. I'm sure it will be making it probably quite anaerobic taking the oxygen out of the water so I would consider that an, an invasive. <clears throat> There's a hippopotamus in there as well with a terrapin on his back. And so, Ramona, that would be an invasive plant. Then we've got quite a few exotics that occur here from time to time, something like that beautiful red star zinnia, which is a Peruvian plant, which comes up in the early summer, is a beautiful red kind of daisy-looking plant. Now, that would be an exotic, but it's not invasive. It doesn't take over areas of natural vegetation. It kind of grows and then disappears again. It doesn't have any deleterious effects that we know of. Then, of course, you get things like lantana sometimes. There's, there are some indigenous species of lantana, but there are also some exotic ones that can become invasive. And if we see them, we take them out. And then along the rivers, especially the rivers that flow out of the communities where the catchments are in human settlement areas, often you'll find them lined with things like Mexican poppy, wild tobacco, and various other plants which are, do become invasive if they're not looked after. But there are groups in South Africa, like the non-governmental organization called Working for Water, that come and clean out alien invasive vegetation because, of course, their major effect is to suck out water from natural water systems. And that, of course, can be a disaster. Look at that kudu slaking his thirst there. You can almost feel the cool water going down his throat and the relief that he must be feeling. It makes me thirsty just watching him. wonderful. And then, Andrew, if you don't mind, I don't mean to huck you, but 
on top of the wall there, you can see a wildebeest. And he looked like he might try and cross over the wall there, but of course his path is blocked by the other elephant. And I wonder, oh, there are a few more there. No, that's another, that's a nyala. There are all sorts of animals here. The kudu in the corner there, you can see them. There's a nyala, I can just see his horns approaching from the other side through there. So lots and lots going on. I think we should sit exactly where we are. I think we're far enough away for those kudu to eventually stop being terrified and come and have a drink. And here comes the big bull now. He looks like he's lumbering out of the water. Isn't he great? Now, we saw a little while back, we saw three elephant bulls here, two behemoths and one youngster. I'm not sure that any of these are the same ones. Mm -hmm. He's not happy with that wildebeest. He thinks it's very, very cheeky that the wildebeest and those kudu should think about coming to drink some of his water. <coughs> And I said this the other day when we were sitting here with those elephants. I said, <clears throat> when you're looking at an elephant like this, there really isn't any doubt as to who the real royalty out here is. People will call the lion the king. And I look at an elephant bull like this, and there's just no doubt in my mind that the lion is but a mere underling, a duke or an earl, perhaps. But this is the real royalty out here. Hello, Rachel. You're just seven years old, and it's wonderful to have a question from a seven-year-old champion of the wilderness. You obviously love wildlife, and that's great. You want to know how long an elephant's trunk is? Well, Rachel, it depends on the size of the elephant, really. Just like your arm, of course, is going to grow as you get older, so an elephant's trunk grows as it gets older. So that little elephant that we saw earlier probably has a trunk of about three feet long. And this big bull that's going past us now, well, his trunk is probably, mm, I'd say, almost, what should we say, probably almost 10 feet long when it's stretched out, maybe nine feet, so very long. And there. <laughs> there on the wall, the kudu are receiving a bit of a bollocking from that younger bull. See him swaggering down? That's a typical kind of swagger that says, get out of my way. I'm going to brook no question here. And he's obviously also, well, not obviously, but... <laughs> and the others are not really taking him very seriously. They're kind of moving out of his way begrudgingly. Come on, Vildi, brave him. I wonder if he hasn't been avoiding the water because of the bigger bull. Now it's his turn. He's going to monopolize all the resources here. Now he can, he can see the kudu behind him. He'll be able to see them. And he's obviously just a little bit irritated. He's now chasing that blacksmith lapwing in front of him. goes. I'll be interested to know if those kudu are actually prepared to come straight down the front of the damn wall there if they'll go to the other side. Look, straight down. That's amazing. That's really steep, everyone. That is, um, I mean, that's nearly vertical. drink. Now, kudu, nyala, bushbuck, stienbok, dika, not very water dependent. They can survive with very little water. They get a lot of water from their own food. Now, the wildebeest, of course, which has disappeared, seems um, incongruous here with the kudu. 
And Paul Rizzo, you want to know if he's the point man for this herd of kudu. No, I think he's probably just hanging out with them in the same way that bull wildebeest like to do with impala. It helps them to keep alive, basically. They're around more eyes and more ears and more noses, and so it helps them to avoid predators because we don't get big herds of wildebeest here, and so often the lone bulls will spend time with other species in order to keep them safe. And I think he was that's all he was doing. I think he'll be tolerated by those kudu. There we are, going into the water now. I think we should go and get a little bit closer. Let's have a look. <laughs> Safari Dean, um, you want to know if I wish I had elephant's ears to keep me cooler in this heat. Safari Dean, I think I'd look a little silly with elephant ears, to be honest. I think my ears are quite big enough the way they are. But yes, I wouldn't mind having some, some elephant ears to keep me a little bit cooler. So I'm just going to ease around here. And I think this guy is bored. I think he's chasing Kudu, and I think he's now decided that he wants to come and see what we want. I thought he might do this. He came out of the water definitely because we came down to the edge here. Now, at the moment, there's no aggression from him at all. It's very much just a bull sort of looking about the place. And maybe he's just going to go off and join his friend. He does look kind of frustrated, though. And guinea fowl in front of him is definitely a bit wary. Now he's watching us. He's pretending to feed, you can see there. It's almost as if he's trying to con us into believing that he's not looking. And the guinea fowl are now skedaddling out the way. And as he does that, look at all the dust there coming up. Hello, Randall. You're in Illinois, in Illinois, in America, and you want to know if elephants ever eat meat. No, they don't. They may find, you may find them chewing on bones every so often. Um, if there's a severe nutrient shortage, they'll eat either bones or some, they'll engage in what we call geophagia. They'll eat rocks and sand if they're feeling particularly nutrient deficient, but no, they don't have a digestive system that can cope with meat, and so they won't eat meat. There's a beautiful ring-necked dove who's just lurking about the water here as well, trying to find a few grass seeds, a couple of insects to eat. Look at him in juxtaposition of the size of that elephant. Isn't that wonderful? <coughs> Excuse me. That's really fantastic to see. And there are some, there are some, <laughs> some guinea fowl digging away at the elephant dung. And of course, they're looking for insects that are buried in the elephant dung, perhaps even the old seed that's in there. That's fantastic. Isn't that great? And Zumi KP, you say that you can hear the peeping of the baby thickney bird that you saw being born, or sort of saw, saw soon after birth, around here under the deck there. I will try and have a look for it, KP, but I can't go right, uh, bless you, Andrew, I can't go right under that deck because it is someone's home. Well, there are two decks, actually. There's one there. That's probably the one under which you've seen it, but we can't go that close. 
So I'm afraid I can't see the little baby dick up, but we'll have a look around. I can see a blacksmith lapwing. I can see some doves, a three-banded plover. Oh, there's even a sandpiper there. I am just scanning. There's a jacana. And I'm just scanning around to see if I can't see the wee baby dick hop or thick knee that you've seen. I have checked every time I've come here, I promise. I can't see him here at the moment. So lots of kudu now going past. A couple of nyala, a big herd of nyala coming up onto the, not nyala, what are those things called again, Andrew? Impala. Impala coming up onto the dam wall, and they'll come on and have a drink again, going down that near sheer vertical cliff. And interesting that they've all decided to come here as the elephant has left. Hmm. That is quite a jump. So I think what we'll do is we'll just watch those impala jump down here and see if or if they go round, and then we'll press on and see what we can find. Our plan from here will be to go north towards the Marikeni drainage system, which is the main drainage line that runs through Arethusa, and then on towards Sydney's dam to see what's going on there. And maybe, if we're lucky, those wild dogs will start to get moving. I don't think yet. It's still quite early for them, but maybe by the time we get there around 6 o'clock, they will be moving. There goes the elephant up and over the top of the damn wall, eating bits and pieces. I don't think he's going to go very far from here. All righty. As we are leaving, let us go across to Jamie, see what she's doing. I'm not sure where she is or what she's up to, so please go and find out from her and tell me the next time I see you. Just to continue on our conversation earlier that James took over and you got a brief glimpse into our background workings, for which we do apologize. The invasive plant species that the elephants have been thoroughly enjoying at Buffalo's Hook Dam. And of course, not a trace of water at this point, and I don't think even the deep wallows have got any water left in them. But what's interesting to observe is the fact that the elephants are still coming through here and in fact have been through here probably earlier today. I've noticed a whole load of tracks moving down through into the Buffelshoek Dam and it's probably to stretch across that mud and go and munch on those plants as well. They might be finding some water underneath the mud. I don't think so. The last time I came here was a couple of weeks ago when I went down into the dam and Wildebeest and I walked down and examined all of the different mud wallows and holes. There was a tiny, tiny little bit of water. I think that will now be pretty much thoroughly depleted. The reason I actually came up in this direction was I thought that if Tingana was in the Chitwa area, which is one of Mbula's favorite haunts, there was a chance that Mbula might have been pushed up towards Buffel's hook side. And he does enjoy these shady patches in the sand. No sign of him, unfortunately, but interestingly enough, this is where Karula came from when she walked across sometime last night and when they tracked her to Torchwood, this is the area that she was in. That's interesting news and it is a ray of sunshine in my day or a glimmer of hope certainly about Karula and her cubs because if she's coming from these drainage line systems around Gwari Pan, there's more hope that maybe those cubs are in that area. Lots of go-away birds calling, but in a sort of a half-hearted, it's a very lazy rather than their normal explosive alarm calls. I don't think there's any leopards hiding here. But you never know. Let's go and investigate the dip, find out if maybe they're around this side. And then failing that, we'll go back to our general standby, which is to race across to Sydney's dam and find out what's happening there spent a considerable and very productive amount of time at Sydney's dam over the last few days. I'm just going to go 
go through this dip in case we lose a little bit of signal. And then I will get back to the dryness and the dustiness that B. Wilson has commented on. Driving along, we mentioned earlier when those two vehicles moved past us how Brian and myself were going to be sneezing and itching. What was that? Is that just a dog? Sorry. I'll get back to that train of thought in a moment. I just need to reverse carefully down the hill. I think I saw a little bird of prey shoot up off the grass, or off the, off the road, rather. I'm just going to make sure I don't reverse off the road in my haste to find it. Here. Not sure where it went. I have had the most extraordinary African goswarp sighting in this drainage line. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're still living around here. But wherever it went, I'm afraid it's disappeared somewhere that way. This clutch sounding a little bit painful. Oh yes, earlier I commented on the fact as the dust went whirling that Brian and myself were going to be sneezing and Lee Wilson was wondering, is there a chance of a dust storm here? Because it does look incredibly dry and dusty at this point. And it is incredibly dry and dusty. Lee Wilson, you're absolutely correct. It's dry, dusty, hot and baking this afternoon. There isn't, however, that strong a chance. distracted again. I think I might have a track quiz for you. I do have a track quiz for you. Let me find a nice spot to show you these tracks. This is probably going to be the best approach. Oh, that puts us in the shade. If I go... You can see which tracks I'm looking at, hey Brian? Yeah. If I put them in the sun like that, perfect. Here we go. Interesting. I'm going to hop out to give you a little bit of perspective because at first glance, this is terribly confusing looking. Track quiz for all of you, and I think our regular viewers should get this fairly easily. Not where I would have expected to find it. So, front foot here. One, two, three, and two little residual dots there. And the back foot falling here. Next stride, one, two, three of the front foot with two little dots, and then a sort of an indistinctive pattern of the back foot where it falls here. I'm personally surprised and quite excited. There's also a little bit of a sweep. This might give it away. There's a little bit of a sweep along here, moving down in line with the tracks. Hmm. I think we should get this fairly quickly. I almost feel as though I should say fastest, fastest three answers to get that track right. Send it through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Three toes in the front foot, one indistinct foot, and a sweep or a drag mark. And while we wait for the answers to that quiz, James has got some beautiful birds for you. So you're back with us, everybody, and that is a European bee-eater sitting on a dead knobthorn tree. And I just think that is the most spectacular picture. Beautiful bird with yellow and blue and gold and a little bit of green. And it will shortly, well, not too shortly, in a month or so, decide to head back north to Europe from where it gets its name and where it breeds. But you can see that gold color on its back shining. Isn't that lovely? And a red eye, beautiful. You can even see its red eye. And it's like a little, bit like the swallows. It's built like a fighter jet to catch insects on the wing and change direction with a quite astonishing speed. But they, they soar higher often than the swallows do. And so I think they, they probably catch insects higher up and slightly bigger insects too. Now what I'm gonna ask Andrew to do, yeah, ex exactly. Just look at the tree color of the tree and the bird and the sky behind. 
And if that doesn't fill your soul with the sense that something is right in the world, well, then I'm not sure what will. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> it's little scenes like this, everyone, that make me really love living out here. Of course, we want to see the wild dogs in full flight and the leopards draped across the tree limbs and the elephants bathing and swimming. But it's little scenes like this that really touch the heart, I think. Right, on we go. We left the dam, obviously, at Arethusa, and we're heading towards the Murray Kenny drainage line. There is some cloud off to the west, but I don't think it's going to do anything to cool us down today. Ooh, sorry. Before we before we continue, Andrew, there's a much larger version of the spider's webs. Two spider's webs. There. I'm just going to get out here because I. I'm just interested to see whether the big one that Andrew's looking at now isn't perhaps also being used as a nest by a bird. So, Lisa, you were asking about golden orbweb spiders. This, of course, is not a golden orbweb spider. But it is a community nest spider, and there are two of them here. Here's the first one. And that's a very small nest there. And I just want to look into the bigger one while you look at the small one, simply because there looked to be a big bit of a hole in it. And in some of these really big ones, you'll find sunbirds come and nest. But this one, I think, is only... I don't know, it looks like this one's definitely been investigated. No, but it's just full. It's full of little sort of shells, exoskeletons from long devoured invertebrates that have flown or dropped into the nest. So normally, that's a community, community nest spider largely made up of a, a group of fairly vicious female spiders who will regularly eat the males if not enough flies into their nest to eat. But they're totally harmless to people. So for the arachnophobes of you out there, and I'm sure there are a few of you, uh, don't worry, they are totally harmless to human beings. Okay, re-plug myself in so that Kirsten might talk to me. And there we go. And did you see how I took the microphone out there? Wasn't that clever of me? Yes. Yes. Just give me credit, Andrew, otherwise I feel, I feel uh, rejected and despised. Thank you, thank you very much. And we were asked about fire earlier on, of course. Colleen's husband was asking us about fire. And if you look into the bush here, and I pointed this out last time I came through this area, there was a fire through here two years ago. And you can see the shape of the vegetation has changed. A lot of the tops of the trees have been killed off, but they're growing from the bottom. And this is a classic symptom of an African tree that's been burned. They are completely used to being burned and completely used to fire and they survive it with great ease. They just kind of sacrifice the top layer and then grow again from the base. And so what fire often does, quite contrary to thinning vegetation out, it actually makes it thicker. There's a large vulture up there, Andrew. Do you see it? Yes. It's that great big ominous looking bird sitting in the dead tree, making it look even more ominous. And that is the white-backed vulture, the most common vulture species that we get here. We get, we've got a kill. What? Oh, I see. A stunning kill there. Well done, Andrew. A bee eater with some form of insect. I can't even see where you're looking. Oh, there. Brilliant. I'm just trying to identify what it's got there. Looks like a beetle. It is a beetle. It's definitely a beetle. Now, what it's doing there, 
It's a very important thing that it's doing there is it's breaking up the exoskeleton. So obviously an insect has got an exoskeleton. They don't have internal bones. They've got a shell outside them that is made of keratin. And uh, what's the other substance? It's ker keratin and lignin, I think. No, lignins in plants. Anyway, it's made of keratin largely. And very, very difficult to digest. And so the bird obviously doesn't have any teeth with, on it. So it's got to chew it up and then swallow it. And not chew it up, it's got to smash it up and then swallow it. And that's why it's bashing it against the wood like that, just to kind of break up the exoskeleton and make it more easily digestible. What a wonderful shot. Well done, Andrew. That was the same European bee eater. Well, I don't know if it's the same individual, but it was an a European bee eater. And there is the vulture looking for dead things from where he sits. And because they're so often seen on carcasses, obviously that's what they like to eat, they are believed in many of the local customs out here to be able to foresee the future. They can foresee death. And that unfortunately has made them quite popular with traditional herbalists and medicine men and women. And so if somebody is desperate and looking for money, they will often poach a vulture and sell it to a traditional healer. And so that is a real threat that they face in the rural areas. So you don't find them much outside of protected areas because of that reason. Right, let's carry on. Yeah. Right. Let's go. Let's go back to Jamie. I know we disturbed her. She was busy telling you a story when we came across that bee eater. So we'll carry on into the drainage line here, and you go back to Jamie. tracking quiz. It's nice. It's, I was saying to Brian, it's probably one of the best examples of this animal's tracks that I've seen while I've been here. And what's fascinating is that I have reverse tracked, accidentally basically, but reverse tracked this little creature all the way to Bufflesook boundary opposite Gauri Cutline, which for those of you familiar with the setup of Juma and the road network, is quite a fair distance. And I almost feel as though I might beg to borrow a Brent's camera trap and set it up somewhere around on one of those pathways. See if this animal is walking along them regularly. I mean, I would love to do and get a view of it. See if we can capture any pictures. However, there's a couple of you who know what I'm talking about and who have got the answer absolutely correct. And before I go on to that though, I want to just talk about those of you who answers that maybe were not entirely correct and I want to just explain why they're not correct because it's no good just telling you the right answer without explaining it properly. So the guess about it being a hippo was not actually correct and the reason why and maybe it's difficult to get a perspective of scale which I can completely understand from the perspective of watching the show. The track that I was looking at was about the size of my hand so the largest part those three toes that we looked at three prominent toes are about the size of my hand. That's the back track of the animal. And that little indistinct track in the front is the front track. Now a hippo's track is probably about the size, for a small hippo, of your side dinner plates. It would sort of fit into that. For a larger hippo, for a bull hippo, it would be almost the size of a dinner plate. Which you might serve up for a nice large um, Sunday lunch or celebratory evening. Whatever you might, whatever you might use your plates for dinner every day would also be another option. Big, big tracks. And if I find some, and I should be able to find some to explain it, I'll give you a rough difference of perspective and I'll draw the track that we saw in the middle of a hippo track to have a look. Now, Safari Dean, who I believe has attempted two answers, one of which was a honey badger. Safari Dean, that's a close option and I can completely understand why you guessed that. As you know, honey badgers have those long, long claws that stick out in the front of the track. Very similar. A honey badger and a porcupine track are incredibly similar. And what's different about them is mainly the presence of those claws. But the claws don't lie flat in the sand. So they don't make those three long tracks that we saw before. And in fact, only really touch at the tip, at their tips. So what I mean by that, and I think I'm going to find a nice sandy spot to pull over and just draw for you what I mean. I'll give you a bit of a demonstration. 
funny badges, though, you are on the right track in that they have three very prominently um, close together toes, and then two toes slightly off to the side, either side. But those three, I can understand where the guess about the honey badger came from. I'm looking for a nice patch of sand and a nice patch of light. Oh, there's an elephant there, though. So we uh, won't be doing... Actually, we could maybe... Maybe not. There's elephants all around me. I was going to do a sneaky tracking segment, but unfortunately... But unfortunately, of course, I'm always happy to see elephants. But it does mean that I can't get out of the car and draw for you. Here we go. Lovely herd of elephants coming through. I think this is the same female. It looks like it might be. I needed to turn. And we saw the other day right in the spot. It is. It does look like does it look like that old female that we saw? I think it is. Slightly skewed tusks. I think it is her. The grandmother elephant. The one that's probably about, I guessed, somewhere in the region of 45 to 55 years old. Lovely old elephant. Can we put that tracking segment on hold, if you don't mind? Because I do want to be able to draw out the different tracks that people have guessed and just provide a bit of more of a clear explanation. Because it's not just a matter of getting the right answer, it's knowing why an answer is correct, which I think is always helpful. Hello, little one. I think this is the little male that came and gave us a bit of a head shake and a talking to the other night, the other afternoon as well. Brian, it is with you, hey? Yeah, it is the same herd. Exactly the same spot as well. It's fascinating. And I think this is this could well be the herd that we saw. We were sitting around the swimming pool this afternoon, trying to cool off. And an entire herd came racing past the fence, and you could see their excitement. I know that Brent describes it as an elephant water walk. This was a water run towards the Juma Dam as they sprinted off. I'm going to just go forward ever so slightly so that we've got a better view as this female approaches. problem. Here comes the grand old matriarch behind one little, this little male can only be with that amount of attitude. Oh, there's nothing like the feeling of peace and this is, there's a lot of babies in this herd. Not young young babies but a lot of youngsters. Awesome. One, two, three. A couple of the herd members crossing in front of us. Here's that female that came and flapped her ears at us the other day. And as I said, this ancient matriarch, Grandmother Ellie. I wouldn't say ancient, but she's definitely seen her fair share of years come and go with those collapsed temporal region, her hip bones starting to protrude ever so slightly. Hello, little boy. Are you going to come and be brave and big and scary? Or are you just munching there? Yes, you're very scary. Again, this little one secreting from his temporal glands, but the rest of the herd is perfectly relaxed. Now he's reaching the teenage years and there comes a little one at the back. You better hurry to catch up. <laughs> Hasn't got to the point of getting her tusks yet. I'm quite surprised by that, actually. She looks large enough. Might be a little tuskless elephant. There's a couple of tuskless herds wandering around. I'm oh, sorry, it's a little boy. It's a little male calf. 
no sign of the tusks coming through. They usually are quite clearly visible at about three years of age. And the whole herd wandering across onto Buffel's Hook in search of more water, I imagine. There's something so peaceful about a view like this. A whole elephant herd completely ignoring us, apart from the one little boy, and just going about their afternoon business. You can just imagine how hot it must be being a one ton or one to up to six ton elephant. How discomforting that would be without those magnificent air conditioning units that are their flapping ears. Built to cool down a gargantuan creature. And of course, the larger the volume, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio and the harder it is for them to either gain heat or lose heat. But for elephants, they need to have a constant cooling mechanism. We've had a wonderful elephant afternoon. James with those bulls at Arethusa Dam and us with the breeding herd. And we've spoken before about the elephants being a bit more stressed out, a little bit more harassed by the large males in the area. And if Gerard was wondering, how often do we see male elephants fighting? Um, it depends how seriously you mean. If you mean a serious, serious conflict, and that does occasionally occur, particularly between two large bulls when they can't agree on who has access to the female, that's a fairly unusual situation. Almost inevitably, the younger males will give way to the older, more sizable male elephants. But if you happen to have, for example, one in must that refuses to back down, or two elephants of equal size, then you do get really serious fights that can actually end in death for one or both of the individuals concerned. Gerard, I haven't seen any while I've been here. I've only ever seen one serious clash between elephant bulls in my lifetime, and I think I was very fortunate to see it. Although perhaps I've just been working in the wrong areas. I think it's probably more common in areas such as Botswana, and probably further into the more open areas of the Kruger, where you get a lot of the large elephant bulls. You might have a better chance of seeing it. What is very common to see is a play fight between elephant males play fighting where they bash their tusks and their heads together but without any real intention it's basically just a little bit of a rumble to keep each other entertained and to practice for when they might need to use those skill just like a sparring competition our elephants are moving on to Buffel's Hook, and James has got an interesting water bird to show you while I head across to Sydney's Dam. Well, yes, there is an interesting water bird, and I'll leave you to guess what is sitting in amongst the interesting water bird. That water bird is called a hammerkop, which means hammerhead, and uh, it's called that by Andrew because its head looks like a hammer. That's why it's called a hammerhead, yeah. Uh, you can see that. And what it's doing is very patiently waiting for a frog or a fish to go by, but I think a frog probably sitting dead still, hoping that that little dripple of water... There, got him. What was that? A tiny fish? I didn't see what that was. It was so fast. If she can slow yeah. Maybe final control can slow mo and tell us what that was. Anyway, and amongst the... Hamakop are lots and lots of buffalo bulls. And this is a very peaceful little scene here at a pan called Second Windmill Pan here at Arethusa. And lots and lots of beautiful mud for the buffalo to wallow in. So we just had one rolling about with his legs stiff in the air. He looked again like Jerry doing some yoga. 
Uh, well, she doesn't do it in the mud, really, but, you know, it looked like a p pretty difficult pose to be striking. So we'll have to ask Jerry what that particular pose is called. And we've also had a number of woodland kingfishers around here. Lovely iridescent blue or halcyon blue shining in the sun that has finally set behind a bank of grey clouds. Mercifully, it is starting to get a bit cooler. Well, these bulls will happily drink this water. They will lie in it, they will go to the loo in it and show no ill effects whatsoever. Sorry, I've just seen something very odd. Wait one second here. And you just, you, uh, it was the, <laughs> was the buffalo's tail. I thought it was a crab that was crawling down the back of the buffalo there. But it isn't, it is the buffalo's tail that is cunningly disguised in the shape of a crab. The other animal that was in here is a serrated hinged terrapin. Now, we've seen a few of them kind of just sort of, uh, what would they be described as doing? Not wallowing in the mud, but sort of scraping about in the mud, trying to find bits and thing, pieces to eat, climbing on the buffalo when they can, but they're not really tolerated in the same way that hippo will tolerate them. There's one there. Another one popped its head up for a, a breathe. Now, of course, a serrated hinged terrapin, much like a turtle, is an air-breathing animal. It cannot breathe under the water. They are reptiles, and therefore they must breathe clean, open air. When they're under the water, they are holding their breath in exactly the same way that you are when you are having a swim under the water. So please remember that. Don't confuse them with amphibians, like frogs or salamanders. Is that a, what I think it is? Last time I could, no, it's not, is it? It is, it's an old one. That is a, well, that's a woodland kingfisher, but in front of the woodland kingfisher, I think, was an old foam nest frog nest. Was it a leaf, Andrew? No, foam nest frog. It is. That's an old foam nest frog nest. Now, normally at this time of the year, every piece of puddle and water you've got is covered or every overhanging branch over every piece of water we have is covered in these foam nests which contain the grey tree frog and the eggs of the grey tree frog. And when they hatch, they eat away at the foam and then drop into the water. And the foam acts, there's a brilliant one, perfect. So that's an active one. You can see it's still quite moist. And the tadpoles will eat out of that once they hatch, drop into the water, and they're kept very safe from the elements in there and from predators. I think that foam is not particularly nice to predators. But this year, that's the first proper one I've seen. Really lovely sighting here of some buffalo, foam nest frogs, terrapins, hummocop, woodland kingfisher, and in the background, the sound of the grey hornbill. And one last thing I want to look at once we've looked at that buffalo. And if you wouldn't mind showing us this chap who's looking at us with a very imperious, very imperious look on his face. He has obviously had his head covered in mud the whole day. And despite the fact that he's looking at us like a sober judge in a British courtroom, one cannot take him seriously covered in that amount of mud on his face. You can see his ears till a thousand stories of many years in the bush running through the thorns, trying to escape lions and fighting within the herd. Gerda, an interesting question. Oh, there's a rubbing post. So that, these, well, in fact, there are quite a few of them around here. All these stumps would have been rubbed smooth by the buffalo and the warthogs and the rhino that come through here and rub themselves and scratch away the itches and then walk away. And some of them are polished totally smooth. Hadda, you want to know about um, making eye contact and whether animals are aggressive or not when you make eye contact with them. As far as I know, Gerda, certainly no animal out here has ever become aggressive to me because I've looked at it in the eye. And I've looked at them all in the eye very often. I think that that comes from there are some monkeys behind us. I'm just, mm, yeah, let's just, I'm just going to turn slightly further while I'm answering your question. And the only animal that I can imagine it maybe perhaps making a difference to would be a 
for example, a wild dog, simply because the only domestic animal that I know of that reacts to eye contact is a dog. I don't know that cats do it, and certainly I rode horses for many years, and no horse I ever rode responded to eye contact. So I think it's probably just about only the domestic canids that do it, perhaps wolves, maybe wild dogs, but certainly not a buffalo. And there are some monkeys. I don't mean in the car, of course. I mean in the tree there. A little baby, little baby monkey, see? With his mum. <laughs> Having a suckle. It always amazes me, you know, when I watch, when I watch wildlife with little ones, especially closely related ones to us, like the monkeys, and the lack of fuss shown for offspring is amazing. You know, human beings, when they have babies these days, especially if they're in cities and in the Western world, they've got to buy thousands of different chadunta, which is a nice Afrikaans word that doesn't have an English equivalent. It just basically means stuff. It, thousands of rands and dollars worth of things to keep this child okay, things to go in the car, things to go for a walk, things to go for a run, things to carry its nappies in, different kinds of things to feed it, different attachments to the body, carried on the front, carried on the back, carried on your head. A monkey or an impala, they just don't have that issue. There's a big herd of buffalo coming in here now, a breeding herd coming in. So I think we'll stay right where we are. While, this, while they come in. And you know, that monkey just, you know, when the baby wants to feed, it feeds. And when the mother wants to move, the baby jumps on the front and off they move. There's no question of taking 45 minutes to pack a nappy bag, uh, get the car seat in the car, pack a bootload of toys before you can move off to possibly have a bite to eat other than in your own kitchen. And I find that in the rural areas out here, it's very much the same. Babies fit in with the parents rather than the other way around. Hello, Rocky Knight. Um, I think I'm hearing your question correctly. We don't have a great deal of signal here with the final control, but you want to know, you think you've never seen this pan before and you want to know where it is. It's on Arethusa, the northwestern corner of Arethusa sort of central western Arethusa. Over the back of the pan there where those buffalo are standing is elephant plains. So we're right on the western edges of our traversing area. And we do come here, we come past here quite a lot. And sometimes there are buffalo in here and sometimes there aren't. But because the signal can be a bit dodgy in this area, this is something really fun happening here. We don't normally stop. Very nice. Breeding herd thinking about coming to have a drink here. Hmm. Now, Gilly in Wisconsin, you have been surprised on the chat because none of you have ever heard um, crabs mentioned on Drive before. We do get freshwater crabs here, Gilly. And I actually learned that from, of course, one of the great experts in the small things that we find out here, and that was Mark, who used to present for Wild Earth. And he found, well, it was through him that I, I didn't actually work with him, but he found a crab's nest at Juma. And he showed Scott, and Scott in turn showed me. So you will find freshwater crabs in and around these little pans, but they're very difficult to see. This herd of buffalo is quite nervous of these bulls, I think. And Andrew, just look here quickly. Sorry, there's a rubbing going on. You can see, <laughs> you can see why these posts have been rubbed so perfectly smooth. That one has very clearly got a deeply injured or deeply itchy undercarriage, and his friend, for the sake of. Uh, his privacy is standing between the camera and him. I think that's very kind indeed. <laughs> he knew precisely that the camera was going to be on him, and so he got in the way of it for his friend.
<laughs> so it's a little herd of buffalo coming in here. It's not a big breeding herd. And I, the last four or five breeding herds I've seen have been this big. They've been tiny. Well, other than the big one, about 250 I saw yesterday morning, or two mornings ago, I can't remember when it was now. And I wonder if it hasn't because they've been split up by lions that have been chasing them around the place. It might just be because they're focusing on these tiny bodies of water. Hello, Gracie. You've joined us again, and you want to know if that little monkey over there... If, if, if I think that monkey would like to sit on my head and drive around the bush. Gracie, I'm very sure that that little monkey would like nothing less than sitting on my head and driving around the bush. They're very scared of people, you know. And I know that you've probably seen a few things on TV where monkeys will sit on people's shoulders or sit on their heads. A wild monkey like that would be very, very scared of me on all people. Right, we were looking at some beautiful European bee eaters earlier. My favorite bee eater now with Jamie, the red version. I know that you were looking at the European bee eaters with James earlier. Here we have the strikingly colored carmine bee eater in the a day before Valentine's Day, an early Valentine's gift for you all. I present to you one of the pinkest birds you can find. And I think tomorrow, when Brent and myself are on drive in the morning, for you it will be just before Valentine's Day, for us it will be the start of Valentine's Day, I think I shall challenge him for the first person to be able to find a carmine bee eater, and that person wins Valentine's Day. Because, as with all days, Valentine's Day must be have some degree of competition to it. But there you go, my, one of our latest arrivals, a late arriving migratory species, much longer, thinner tails than most of the other bee eaters. And they really are extraordinary looking birds. That you can see where the carmine comes from. That bright pink and red, and even in the setting, in the setting sun, it highlights it even more. And they come through. Some of them, interestingly, some carmine bee eaters breed here and some do not, which is quite fascinating to me. They breed in both where they migrate from and down to here. And off he goes in search of insect prey. We go forward a little bit. That shape of the tail is so interesting. It's got a joined by a friend, I think, and it looks like it might be a European. Let's see who we've got here. Oh, no, wait, we're going back again. Oh, oh. Where are we going? Which way are we going? Oh, we're going back to the dead tree. Thank you, Bita. <laughs> and back to the same branch. The joys of live wildlife filming, and particularly live bird filming. What, there's what looks to be a European bee eater just below it, but it's unfortunately quite far behind the bushes, so you can't really get a good perspective. I wanted to try and show you the comparison between the two and this, give you an idea of the scale. But carmine bee eaters have the most fascinating tails. They've got a, a sort of a, a normal length bird tail and then from the middle of it projects one or two or about three long spindly feathers, giving it that long, long tail tip. It's a really interesting shape, and it's a wonderful way that they've evolved to, I, I can only guess, at increased maneuverability. I'm attempting to dig through a combination of Brent and myself's... There we go, that's what I was looking for attempting to find the bird book so that I can show you a closer picture of what it is I meant by the shape of that tail. Really beautiful bird. Oh, wow. Look at it in that sun. 
like all bee eaters, as their name suggests, and that long curved bill gives away, specialized insect catchers. And it's very, very common to see them whip a, b a bee or a stinging wasp out of midair and then land on a branch like this one and slam their beak repeatedly and essentially beat away the sting of the insect before they swallow it. One of those bird species that would nest in the holes like the ones we pointed out right at the very start of the drive. Awesome. I just want to show you a quick picture of our carmine bee eater's tail so that you can get a bit of a perspective on what I mean about it. There you go. That incredible tail. You can see what I mean. It's got that normal length, to almost a V type approach to it. I'm going to try and move my hand so that I can get more sun on the picture. Oh, I don't think it's going to work. There we go. That works a little bit better. There you go. And then those spindly spine at the back. And not all of the bee eaters have that. Some of them have the very traditional approach to it. So, for example, if we compare it to one of our other bird bee eater species, like the, let's say, for example, the little bee eater has a little forked tail. It's fascinating how they all have different shapes. <laughs> Really interesting. And we probably get about, we commonly see, I would say about four or five different species here. The most common are the carmine, the white fronted, which is this individual here. The little bee eater that I just showed you. And then right at the bottom, the European bee eater. So four that we would commonly see. But there's so many different bee eater species throughout South Africa, or throughout Africa, I mean, that you could get to see, all with those bright colors, just in different combination with the different colors. Now, my next plan of attack, since Sydney's dam was completely quiet, is to move on towards the hyena den. Since I'm going on leave tomorrow afternoon, I think it's only fair that I get to spend a little bit more time with my, one of my favorite predators before they decide to, in case they decide to move the den while I'm away. And just to finish off the topic of conversation and the birds, Matthew, who is nine years old, would like to know what bird species, or if there are any bird species, that would eat a scorpion. And Matthew, that bee eater is a good example of one that might. Now bear in mind, the squirrel got on the back of its... Oh, it's just funny fluff. It's very strange. I think it's actually a squirrel with a broken tail. Where is it dashed off to? He's hiding. Grabbed something on his way past us. But its tail was hanging in a very strange way. Sorry, Matthew. I'll be with you in one second. Nibbling on whatever particular grass seed he happened to grab. Well done, Brian, for finding him. But back to Matthew, who, Matthew, nine years old, who's asked the question about birds that eat scorpions. Bear in mind, Matthew, that some scorpions only grow to about this big. So from my thumb to my forefinger in length, and really, really skinny, skinny, like little twigs skinny. So a bee eater like that could happily catch one if it was able to find one under bark, for example around the trees. Some of the biggest species of scorpions, the big ones with the large stings, they could well be targeted by even something like a hornbill. Lilac-breasted rollers or purple rollers, European rollers, or the roller family are also well adapted. They've got those big, thick, strong beaks that they can grab scorpions up with and sort of beat away the sting before the, st the scorpion can sting them. And of course, Matthew's absolutely right. There's got to be a technique to catching scorpions because they can sting and they've got venom. A lot of the birds will grab them by that venomous pin or by the venomous sting in their tail and rip it away from the rest of the body of the scorpion, thus essentially disabling them, or disabling the sting, and then continue on to munch them and swallow them down. But we 
do get we get a whole load of different scorpions belonging to different families. Well, the biggest of those, or the scariest of those, for some people, is the Parabuthus, the Buthidae family. And those are the scorpions, as we've repeated many times before, those are the scorpions that you need to watch out for. If a scorpion has a thick tail and thin pincers, those are the ones you want to watch for. And brilliantly, Brian, is this the one that was at um, DRC by any yeah. chance? How amazing is that? Brian's very kindly handed me a picture of one of the most deadly types of scorpion, a paraboothus scorpion. In our bathroom. And there you go, Brian telling us that it was in your bathroom. Where was it in the bathroom, Brian? By the shower. <laughs> By the shower. <laughs> so for all of those members of the DRC, which is the camp in which most of the, the team lives, that is a very scary individual. Now, to give you a bit of a perspective of scale, Brian, how would you, big would you have said that guy was? About the size of my hand? Maybe a little bit smaller? Yeah, about, about a little bit smaller. A little bit smaller than my hand. So this is a sort of a, a real size picture of this scorpion. You see those thin, thin pincers? <laughs> thin pincers. Oh, we keep it alight. So essentially you know that this is not a scorpion that relies upon its pincers for catching its prey. And then that thick, dark, threatening tail with the sting in it. And interestingly, Parabutha scorpions are also capable of spraying venom. So not only can they sting you and get you with that barb, that pointed barb that you can see there resting across the tail. This is brilliant. Thank you, Brian. This is exactly what we needed to show them. But they can also ejected at a distance. Now that being said, it's not like a Mozambican spitting cobra that has fantastic accuracy. Um, it will battle to be able to reach your eyes. In fact, it would probably really only spray your knees. But an awesome picture of a scorpion's anatomy, the four legs, the fused cephalothorax, the head and the thorax fused together, and then those adap adapted pedipulps that extend up as pincers in front of its head. They're fascinating creatures, scorpions. They really, really are. You can actually even see, there's a, I think there's a water drop from the shower on the tip of its tail there. That looks like a water drop to me. <laughs> so, members of the DRC, beware. <laughs> that is lurking in the bathroom. Now, for human beings, in terms of threat level of that scorpion, it's fairly threatening, and I think that the small, if, you are, if you are particularly allergic to bee stings or any kind of insect stings, you might struggle a little bit more in your reaction to it. However, for the most part, a healthy adult isn't going to be threatened by it. You will feel horrible. You might end up in hospital, um, and you feel a little bit like you are dizzy, vomiting, very anxious feelings, and some of that um, venom is neurotoxic. So your heart starts to palpitate and stress due to the increase of adrenaline and the effect that it's having on your synapses firing away. Highly, that being said, now that I've scared you all half to death and put the terror of Parabutha scorpions into you, I've never had a serious encounter with a scorpion. I have been stung by them before, not Parabuthus. I have lived many years in the bush and I've never struggled with them. The chances of encountering them and actually getting stung next to nothing as long as you're cautious. Check the, check the shower curtains. Brian is providing a wealth of scorpion knowledge. I'm just going to move into the shade before I show you Brian's next picture of a slightly less harmful scorpion. This was outside the bathroom. This was outside the bathroom, says Brian. Ladies in final control, are you enjoying our scorpion demonstration? This is, as you can see, in the sand outside. There you can see a lovely difference. Brian really providing some awesome pictures this afternoon. The ladies in final control are not impressed and may not ever shower again. Um, but we have the very large pincers here and the much reduced tail, but there's still a little bit of venom in this particular individual. Uh, I'm not completely wrong, I'm fairly certain this is a, a Pistothamp campus, oof, that's a tongue twister and a half, and Glably Frons. Glably Frons, there we go, there we go, that was the mangling of the Latin name of this scorpion, a Pistothamp, a Pistothampus Glabry Frons. 
Quite a nice relaxed little scorpion. Doesn't often sting, it's not aggressive. It would still hurt, it would hurt like a bee sting would hurt. You can see how different the coloration is. And that in turn gives you a bit of a clue as to its habitat. But you've got a nice front on view, you can see the, the mandibles of the jaw and the forward facing eyes. Interesting creatures, scorpions. I think they're absolutely fascinating. And we very regularly catch them and remove them. Advice for weary travelers that maybe are feeling a bit nervous after this. First of all, scorpion stings are very unusual. Secondly, check before you grab something. They're nocturnal. Most of the species are nocturnal, so nighttime is when you need to be most concerned. So wear closed shoes, always carry a torch, and just check the crevices where you think they like dark hidden places, except for that Parabuthus and the scorpion that in, apparently enjoyed the shower curtain. But you never know. Here you go, Brian, I'm going to pass that back to you. And then the other big place where people get stung by scorpions fairly regularly is wood piles. If you go to put a pile of wood on the fire, be aware that that is one of the main habitats of scorpions. They like to live in the cracks of bark, underneath parts of the bark. That is where they like to spend the daytime. So if you reach forward and grab a piece of log to throw on a fire without thinking, first of all, you might burn that poor scorpion alive. I always like to tap my wood on the ground when I collect it to make sure I've chased away any insects or unsuspecting scorpions. But also just be aware of where you put your hands. Carry a torch, carry a headlamp. My goodness and after all of this I had completely forgotten about the wonderful traps that I saw in fact I don't even think that I've given you the right answer yet I've told you what it's not I haven't told you what it is now the lights got a little bit tricky but I'm going to tell you that Dylan Julia and Safari Dean let's see if I can find a nice way to position us so that we can get this light patch of dirt on the camera patch of dusty road where the sun is shining. How's that, Brian? Can we zoom in there? Perfect. Thank you. I'm going to grab a stick and I'm going to give you a demonstration, but before I do, well done to Dylan, Julia and Safari Dean. It was indeed an art fark. I'm just going to have a look and see if we can draw this out for you a little bit. It's a bit far away. You can see what I can do. I think it's going to show through at this angle, Brian. Yeah. Well, oh, elephant somewhere. So, a little bit of a tracking lesson. This was an art park. Three claws showing really clearly, nice and thick. And then the scrape mark that I spoke about before was its tail moving along with its foot and moving over the top of the track. So that was its tail. An animal that I know the tracks of very well, but have yet to manage to see. Safari Dean came close as well with the honey badger guess. Honey badgers have toes that go like this. One, two, three, and then two little ones on the side. And then the claw marks, instead of doing that flattened version of what an art park looks like, they just tap a distance away from the toes themselves and then the back pad falls here. This is a giant honey badger, it's the biggest honey badger the world has ever seen because my artistic talent is perhaps not up to scratch. But the claws just fall about, I would say about an inch away from where the track actually is. So you don't get that flat of the three claws. And just to go back to the hippo, our track was about this is, the rough, this is a rough sketch of our track. That was about as big as our track was with the little front track here. A hippo would be There you go. The world's best impression of a hippo track anywhere ever seen ever. My artistic skills coming through, that's about as big as a hippo track would be. I think I'm going to have everyone fooled. Next time somebody drives down this road, they're going to take one look at those tracks and go, my goodness, a honey badger and a, oh no, sorry, an art fark and a hippo were walking down the road together. 
totally imperceptible. I would never have known it wasn't actually a hippo that made that track. <laughs> Looks like a child's drawing from this perspective. I don't know, Brian, how you managed to hold back the laughter. <laughs> well, they didn't really hire me for my artistic skills, as far as I know. As I leave my wonderful impression of my artistic version of my artistic interpretation of the tracks that animals leave, I'm going to make my way across the hyena den. In the meantime, let's find out what James is up to. We have turned off the main road onto we are Taylor now, rough patch of the road, and we are now heading for Sydney's dam, hoping, of course, that we are going to see a great big pack of wild dogs coursing across the plains after a hapless herd of impala. At the moment, there is nothing but a drought-stricken land in front of us. We didn't see anything else on Arethusa. We didn't spend too much time there, but it was a very pleasant diversion onto that property for much of the afternoon. It feels like, I know we've only got about 45 minutes left of the drive, but it feels like it's much longer because it's still so bright. There's no kind of dimming in the light because off to the west there, you can see my face is now bathed in a beautiful golden hue. Off to the west there, of course, the light is still undiffused by any clouds. And I can't see anything, Andrew, because I stared straight at the sun. Silly man, James. I'm seeing spots. I'm seeing spots, Andrew. Tell me if I go wrong. Going wrong, James. Oh, dear. Phew. Goodness gracious, that was close. Now, I like this question from Mr. Tuvox. Hello, Mr. Tuvox. Interesting name, that, Mr. Tuvox. You want to know about jackals, the other canid that we get here? The one being the wild dog, the other being the jackal. And do we get them here? Well, we do sometimes. And it's an abiding mystery to me why we don't get more of them. Where I used to work at Ngala, which is only about 50 kilometers north of us here, similar vegetation type, very similar kind of geology of the area. But we used to have a black backed jackal pair in every single clearing. So you'd come through a clearing like this, and there'd definitely be a black backed jackal pair or two living in a clearing like this. Here, not at all. Sometimes we get um, side striped jackals which are slightly different. They're much more solitary. They do live in pairs, but they forage on their own. And they look a little bit like a sort of small wolf, if you like. They don't behave like wolves at all. They eat quite a lot of fruit. But we do get them every so often, but not often at all. I mean, you know, I mean, I think I've seen three or four here in the last year or so. And often at night. I think it's probably got a lot to do with the fact that they are largely nocturnal animals, especially in the presence of pressure from other predators. And there is quite a lot of pressure from other predators in this area, lots of hyenas around at night. And you'll probably find that they therefore move around at night rather than in the day, where they're more obvious. Unlike that diker who thinks he's hiding from me, but I've spotted him. Ah, there you are. Can you see him, Andrew? Yes. You see. He thought he had got me. He thought he'd got one over on me, he did, but he hasn't. His little wet nose. He's still now he's a bit worried. He thinks maybe we've spotted him. He's thinking about moving. Oh, just warming up. There we go. Just in case we've seen him, he's leaving. Now, their much smaller relative is the Steenbok, and they are found in great abundance around here. Uh, we don't, well, I mean, in great abundance, you don't see them in big herds like you do in Parla, but there are lots of them. And they will thrive in this sort of situation. They don't mind the drought at all. They're almost completely water independent, believe it or not. And in some areas, they live parts of Namibia, for example, they won't go and drink anything for probably weeks at a time. 
They derive all the moisture they need from the food that they eat, highly efficient digestive system, very effective kidneys, and filtering out the water so that they don't waste water on urine. They will be absolutely fine. There's a buffalo just ahead of us. You may just see his dark shape moving north into the woodland there. We're not going to stop for him. Just because we've seen lots of his friends. And lovely sky. I mean, that's spectacular. Very nice, Andrew. That's very artistic of you. Hmm. And we're going up a road called Impala Road, which is on the western fringes of Juma. And we're about to come out into another clearing. And again, Mr. Tuvox, the clearing that we're going to come out to now, I mean, I was very used to when I first started guiding, finding always a pair of blackback jackals in a clearing like this. I don't know if you've ever seen jackal pups, but they're definitely some of the cutest things you can ever hope to see out here. Typical kind of dog pups, very inquisitive, very playful. And not much in the way of wild dog pups this year, yet. So here is the clearing beautiful sunset coming as we drive. Oh, uh, Kristen in North Carolina, you want to know what the highest animal in the food chain is and would they be threatened by any other animal? It's not so much a food chain as it is a food network. Kristen, I think that's the best way to describe it. So top of the predator hierarchy would be lions. Nothing eats lions except sometimes other lions. Would they be afraid, however, of other animals? Yes, they would. They'd be afraid of elephants, definitely. They'd be afraid of human beings. We would be, I suppose, considered the top of the food chain in that we are the most dominant predator out here. Are we afraid of anything? Yes, definitely. We'll get out of the way of buffalo if we are not suitably protected. Likewise, elephants and likewise, lions. Would elephants be afraid of anything? No, elephants are not generally afraid of much. They will chase lions and hyenas away, especially if they've got little ones around them. Even wild dogs they will chase away. We don't really know why they bother to do something like that, but they do do it all the time. And they would, I suppose you could call them the top of the food chain. They're the largest, least threatened animals out here. Thank you, Kristen. So nice to have the heat slowly diffusing as the sun sets, but I think we're in for another pretty hot night, and we're in for two more very hot days before we get a little bit of cool. Katrina, very nice question. I talked about canids, and you want to know there's a difference between a canine and a canid. No, there isn't. A canid, I mean, a canine would be, I'm not sure exactly how to describe it. So canidae is the family that all the dogs come from. They come from the canidae, and you would therefore call the canids, any member of that family you would call the canid. I suppose you could call it a canine. I pro there probably isn't a difference. I know most recently, remember, we used to talk about hominids, and now we talk about hominids and hominins. And there is a difference there, for example. A hominid, the, the blanket family is the hominidae, and that would include all the great apes, including, including the chimpanzees and gorillas and gibbons and orangutans. I think they're in the same family. And then the hominins would be our very close relatives. So most of the extinct bipedal ancestors that we have, and I think chimpanzees are also possibly connected to that subfamily called the homininae. But I don't think there's any difference between a canid and a canine. You could certainly use them interchangeably, and I don't think anybody would give you trouble or refuse to serve you a drink at a bar, for example, where you to use the term canine instead of canid. And the only two we get out here, of course, are the jackals and the wild dogs.
I was talking about wild dog puppies, and I said we hadn't seen many this year. Well, of course we haven't. It's much too early in the year, and that dovetails quite nicely into Debbie and Vancouver's question about whether they breed every year or not. They do, Debbie. They will normally breed in the winter time. They will probably mate around May, give birth in the middle of July, 70-day gestation period, so very short. We're just going past these impala as we head towards Sydney's dam. And that, of course, is because the vegetation, well, this looks like winter vegetation now. It's excellent hunting time for impala, at least for wild dogs. They love this kind of vegetation because they can course across it. There's no long grass to get in their way. There are few leaves on the trees, and that's why they normally breed in the winter time, as opposed to when most of the herbivores will breed exactly opposite in the middle of the summer. Now, that's not to say that it's impossible for wild dogs to breed at other times of year, and it might be interesting to see whether perhaps, given the state of things at the moment, they don't breed early this year. It'll be very interesting to see. There are some elephants at Sydney's Dam. How surprising. I'm being sarcastic, of course. I'm not surprised in the least. And I'm hopefully going to see my friend the crocodile which nobody believes me about. Everybody's very suspicious that I saw a hippopotamus and not a crocodile. Andrew, what do you think? In fact, don't say. Just keep quiet and film. There is a herd of buffalo moving off. And I'll just stop down here where we can get a good view of the crocodile. And there we have three elephants and the buffalo left at the waterhole. See any hippopotami at this stage? Very nice little scene there. And the elephants will enjoy this water more than they will most of the small pan water, simply because the amount of dung in it is slightly diluted. We've seen some bull elephants having a few wars of late, pushing each other around the place, especially at the water. Young ones being disciplined by older ones. And Donna, you want to know if females ever have fights. I've never seen a serious fight between two cows, Donna. I have seen them pushing each other around a little bit, but generally they tend to be much more civilized than the males. So I would say probably not, Donna, no, not too much. Yeah, that bull is just chasing the buffalo. They become very territorial about their water at times. I'm scanning the surface of the water for a floating log. I don't see any hippos at the moment. Now, at the beginning of the drive, it was very hot. And I described the scene there, and I asked you to send through three quest words about what you felt and how the sort of scene was making you feel. And we're just going to have a look at the sunset. And while we do that, I, what I would like you to do is think about three more words now, and I'll just describe the scene to you. It's much cooler probably dropped about seven or eight degrees Celsius. The sun has set. The sky has gone from that washed out kind of pale blue to a much deeper, more gentle blue color and that lovely sort of pale lemon yellow has touched the sky. So perhaps send through another three words describing how this might make you feel. I'm just gonna be quiet for another 10 seconds. Let's just listen. some hardy dogs. 
So in fact, no, you can't have three words this time. Send through one word, hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv, and let's see if the impressions that we had from this early this afternoon in the blazing heat have changed now as the subtlety of the evening comes to the fore. Andrew, Andrew, can you get here? Oh, nasty little wasp. That was a spider hunting wasp, and it seemed to have either found its own burrow, here it comes again, or it thinks there's a spider in there. That looks like a scorpion hole to me, though. Possibly looking in there for a scorpion or a spider. Well, it would be definitely looking for a spider. Anyway, Susan, in New York, you wanted to know about whether or not female elephants will give birth after the age of 45. Yes, they will. Andrew is now following the spider hunting wasp. <laughs> Maybe that was a bad idea. And, <laughs> and, and the answer is yes, they do give birth until the day they die, pretty much. Right. Uh, well, that's probably not true. They probably, they probably have five years without giving birth. Let's go across to Jamie. She's with the hyenas. That's you. Arrived in my personal happy place, which is the hyena den on Mbubu Road. And look who has popped out to explore its surroundings. <laughs> One of the newest additions to our hyena clan. Oh, I'm getting involved. Awesome. Already tackling the older cousins. The cubs of the matriarch showing her spirit in terms of, oh, 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 there's going to be squeals. This is where, with toddlers, there would be tears. Oh, ouch. Ah, oh, and that cannot be all that pleasant. Got it by the ears, as instinct tells hyenas to do. And those sharp puppy teeth. Oh, managed to escape. Well done, little one. Well, you did pick that fight. You're going to have to learn to choose battles that you know you can win in life, and that definitely isn't one of them. And as far as I can tell, Madam isn't here. So the mother of the youngest cub isn't here. I'm fairly certain. I, I can't see for absolute sure, but that looks like pretty to me. So the young cubs, what did you just steal? You naughty little thing. Stolen away from one of the older cubs. Now, as our regular viewers know, hyena cubs inherit the status of their mother. And these new little brown cubs, they haven't even got their spots yet. As far as we can tell, are the cubs of the highest ranking female. Oh, had it done. The cubs of the highest ranking female. Well, they've inherited her status within the hyena clan and therefore her attitude as well. And already a clear difference in the behavior between the one twin and the other. I th I'm fairly certain that's, not, that's pretty. It doesn't look scruffy enough to be Madam, the matriarch. Pretty being the mother of the oldest of the newer cubs. But there does appear to be another cub hiding there. I can see an ear suckling so maybe i've got the identity wrong of that hyena i don't think so though might be that it's just november feeding that side hello you back for more you're very brave because mom's not around to hear your squeaks maybe she is she might be just where we can't see her and this i think is the most playful i've seen this brand new cub there's two of them of the same age. Are you going to climb a tree now, little one? <laughs> the one? The thing I love about hyena cubs is their front legs are so much more developed than their back legs. So <laughs> every now and again, there's a bit of a collapse as their knees give in. They haven't quite got the same level of muscle strength. sitting down for a brief rest, off to dement or torment one of the December twins. And of course, all of this play for predators, whether they be leopard cubs, lion cubs, or hyena cubs, 
is essential in the building up of the coordination that they will need. Oh, there you go, you see what I mean? Bit of a speed wobble and a power slide there. <laughs> yes, you. <laughs> Irresistible. Uh, I challenge anyone who watches our show who came with a preconception of hyenas being horrible, smelly, evil creatures to not be able to see the cubs as unbelievably cute. It's definitely November feeding there with Pretty. Being distracted by one of the December twins plus this new bundle of trouble. The ever tolerant mothers of the hyena den enjoying their time here. Our little one dashed across to this patch of tree and Diane wants to know what was hanging from that tree and I can see what you mean, it does look very pink. That dangly bit, Diane, it's a piece of bark. The reason it is so red in color is that it comes from a knobthorn tree which has high levels of tannins and a particularly pink cambium layer. Ooh, there's going to be... You know when you watch toddlers playing or little children playing and you wait for the moment where you know there's going to be tears? This is how this fight is going to go. There's going to be much squealing. This one holding its own though. There we go, November with a clear size difference. Already far bigger than her, his younger cousins. You've got a perfect example here of three sets of age groups born somewhere or at least a first appearance around November, then December, and then late January. So essentially a month's difference between each of our different age sets that we've got here. Fascinating to observe how rapidly they grow. We get to sit with them every day, so we don't really realize. Hard to believe that just three or so or four or so months ago, November was the same size as this little creature wandering around. Yes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> Endless playfulness. And one very patient mom, who I believe is one of the most attractive adult hyenas that we have. Oh, you're getting so brave. Scrambling up the den site, and you're going to fall down. I promise you. You are going to fall down. But as I said, the bold little cub is the cub of the matriarchs. And James Taylor's asked a very good question, which is basically continuing on with our question about the inherited status of the cubs. He's asked, are there different statuses per age group? And the answer is generally, yes, female cubs, older female cubs of the matriarch will have a more dominant status and a more dominant presence than the younger cubs of the matriarch, if that makes sense. So they inherited, inherit their mom's status, for example. This little one, ooh, I might have bitten off more than I can chew here in, t in determining which adult or which sub-adult this is, but it would either be Bella, I don't think so though, I think it might be June, already so grown up, but it could be Bella, who is the oldest son of the matriarch which would put him fairly high ranking and would probably put him above if she has male cubs, but not if she has female cubs. So males always lower ranking than females. It's a bit of a tricky one, James, and the reason I say that, and I'm not sure which female this is, I think, let's see if I can see her right ear. Come on, girl, turn for me. I'm just staying in the position that I'm at just because there is Ello. Ah, there's the, is this the matriarch sitting up there. I can't say I'm staying in this position, but I've changed my mind. Hyena dens keep you guessing. That looks like the matriarch to me, all of those nicks and cuts in the ears. That would explain where the other cub is, the other dark colored cub. It's probably feeding. Uh, James Taylor, just to finish off my answer to that question, people have been studying hyenas for 30, 40, 50 odd years. 
and observing the dynamics of their clans still don't have all of the answers and it differs from place to place where studies have been conducted so a study might bring back a comprehensive and conclusive report on the way in which hierarchy works in the south in the eastern areas of africa or the desert areas of africa that doesn't necessarily it applies in exactly the same way to these little chaps oh. <laughs> making little squealing sounds. The typical, typical squeeing of a cub. Now this hyena den is the perfect place to come and watch interactions occurring between the different clan members. And Koala, who's watching in Holland, who's clearly been to Africa before, parked up at a hyena den for an hour once and counted up to 26 individual hyenas of all ages and wanted to know, oh, hop, skip, you better go back to mommy. There's the other cub sitting with the matriarch, suckling. This other little one on a mission, though. Carla, you wanted to know if seeing 26 hyenas, was this an unusually large clan or a large sighting? Or is it fairly normal? And the answer is it's fairly normal. It depends on where you were in Africa. If it was in the Kruger Park, so essentially the same ecosystem, the same area that we're in. It would be a fairly standard size for a hyena clan. I know the clan on Elephant Plains is exceptionally large. It's numbers about 30 odd hyena strong. Look how brave this hyena cub's being. That's awesome. It's definitely the most action I've seen, nibbling away on the sticks around the den site, exploring its new world with its powerful jaws. And there's mom, giving us a happy upside down smile, a matriarch's grin. Your babies are doing very well, mommy. As we do have another vehicle in the sighting, so I'm gonna need to reposition ever so slightly so that they can get a good view as well. I'm just gonna wait until his engine goes off. I prefer to have one engine on at a time in a sighting such as this. How's it, Julie? How are you? And while I reposition and make sure that the other vehicle can get a nice view, let's pop over and find out what James is up to. We left Sydney's dam and we came down to quarantine clearings in the, under the assumption that there would be great teeming herds of animals here. And um, slightly eerie silence, to be honest. Oh, there's a diker. Good grief, look at that. And our second diker today. it's an element of disguise in order to make predators think that they have a long spiky thing on the top of their heads and in actual fact it's just a little tuft of hair she's the big one they're substantially larger than the males Bird, your one word for that beautiful sunset scene that we had at Sydney's Dam was envy. Well, Bridget, I'm sorry about that, but I suppose it's half a good thing and half a bad thing. But I can know exactly what you mean. It's what I used to feel when I lived in the city. Just twitching the flies off there. Andrew, don't you wish you could do that with your legs? Yes, eh? Rather than slapping them and then spraying DDT on them and basically choking out the atmosphere around the car. I wish you could do that as well. Or if I had a tail, that would be nice. Mm, a tail. Well, perhaps one day they'll invent a way to attach a tail to a human being's sacrum. 
She's a really nice specimen, that. So I was saying, they, they are bigger than the males. Hmm, that's nice. Cl Clown Char Sharon, or peace and connection. I like that connection. That's great. Hmm. What a picture, hey? <laughs> and little Gracie, aged eight, your word, if I can take, you've given three, but I'm just going to use the one. You said magical, and I think magical is a very, very good word for what the place that we live in here. It is truly magical. OK, we're just going to ease our way around quarantine here. I don't think we're going to go anywhere else. At a great speed, we don't have much time left. Light is a fading, the moon is a risen. There's the moon, slightly more than the sliver it was last night. Stunning colors. Andrew, do you want me to stop? No, it's okay, I got it. Ah. Andrew's very skilled, you see. He's not afraid to shoot the moon out while we're moving. Interesting that there are no animals here, or no antelope, or impala, nyala. I'm just wondering if they haven't got wind of the doggies coming this way, but I don't think they have. We go past the fireside chat spot. Now, I love getting questions about the unusual animals here. And of course, when we talk about animals, often people think about mammals only. They don't think that birds and indeed insects are animals as well. And Dolly, you want to know about ladybirds. Do we get them here? We do get ladybirds here. We get various species of them. There we go. Get various species of ladybird here. Some of them are exotic, actually, and some of them but, uh, sort of invasive. But many indigenous species of ladybird or ladybug, beautiful, beautiful things. Not so many this season, of course, simply because we don't have a lot of water around, not a lot of flowers for them to eat, probably not a lot of aphids for them to eat, sorry. And the aphids, of course, are going to be a dearth of them because we don't have too much in the way of new green shoots and flowers. I'm going to go down to the Juma Dam pan quickly. Have a look there. I can smell the wafting of um, Tandagilia's cooking floating out over quarantine clearings. I think we're having a barbecue of sorts this evening, or braai, and that is, smells delicious. Now, this fellow here was here two nights ago, and Brian and I came past. Like that was last night. Hello. Have you moved? Not. Oh, just a comfortable spot. Yes, well, fair enough. It does look quite nice there. Chewing his cud, missing his horn. Hmm. I can see it's getting dark now. Leave him. Ease gently down towards the pan. Oh, Kristen, you're wondering if hippopotami, which we're probably about to see here in the Juma Dam pan, are dangerous. Are they dangerous? Kristen, no animal out here is dangerous unless it is provoked. Hippo are considered dangerous or potentially dangerous because they can be easily threatened. They can get very nervous if you get between them and the water. If they feel like they cannot get to the water that is their home, where they feel safe and unthreatened, then they can be dangerous. They certainly do cause a bit of damage to people around the continent because, you know, almost unwittingly, people get between them and the water. Now, you want to know what makes them dangerous? Well, some enormous canine teeth make them dangerous. I mean, some of them have got teeth like that. And I mean, they will do tremendous damage to you or to anybody if the hippo should have a bite at you. But in a vehicle, 
No, not so much. And they're absolutely fine in a car. They're not going to come and attack the vehicle. And certainly we'd be safe enough to either get out of the way or just stand our ground. There he is, speaking of him. And our hippo like this, of course, is in what we call sub-optimal habitat. He's not in very good habitat for him. He'd much rather be in a flowing river and clean water around other hippos, but because things are so marginal at the moment, things are so dry, these pans are all going to be occupied normally by hippo. I was surprised not to see one there in that second windmill pan that we were at on Arethusa. But I went past a pan today on Cheetah Plains, about the same size as this, and sure as nuts, there were two hippo in there trying to eke out a living in this drought. And tremendously peaceful. We can hear the last calls of the birds' day now. We can hear some Franklins, a couple of blacksmith lapwings, the ubiquitous woodland kingfisher every so often, and a white browed scrub robin calling his last for the day. <laughs> and we were talking about ladybirds and ladybugs just now. And James Taylor, you want to know if we get stink bugs here. Yes, we get some very nasty stink bugs here. Uh, some of the shield bug variety, which uh, have a truly offensive smell to them, they're not that common. But what we do get is these little black stink bugs. And they come in swarms. We haven't had many of them this year, again, because there hasn't been much rain. But these swarms will suddenly emerge from somewhere, I don't know where, and they will get in everywhere. They'll get into your nose, into your ears, into your mouth, into your pajamas, uh, all over your room, and then they will climb into your food. And they will do so in such a way that you do not notice that they have climbed into your food until you have taken a bite and suddenly your mouth is filled with the foulest taste you can imagine. And that will be the end of your food. You will not want to touch food, possibly for another week. So yes, we do get stink bugs here, but thankfully those black ones have not come around this year. Okay, we've had a, well, we haven't had enough, but we certainly, the light has faded and we're done with our little section of the drive. Thank you, Andrew, for your efforts today. Well done, good job. Thank you to all of you for your questions and comments and for playing along when I asked you to send through your words about how this magnificent place that we live in makes you feel. Thanks to the final control. We'll hand you over to Jamie and Brian for the last little while. Thanks again for a great drive, and we'll see you in the morning. Bye-bye. Another stunning African day. I think the slight, even if it is slight, drop in temperature comes as a relief to all of us. I left the hyena den because it's got to the point now where unfortunately the days are getting shorter and the light just isn't holding out long enough for us to finish off our sunset safaris there. As our regular viewers know, we don't shine spotlights on the, the young cubs, that's our policy, and around the den site, just to not add that extra level of distraction and stimulation to their lives. Most of the nocturnal animals, once they are old enough, you can actually spotlight, you can put lights on them. But with youngsters, all of the guides are very, very careful about the level of interference that we have. They don't have quite the same level of experience that the adults do in terms of being on alert and dealing with any kind of potential threats. So we don't want to add to their distraction. But that was an awesome sighting with that little cub. I think that's the most active I've seen them since they first popped their noses out of that den site about a month ago. Exciting stuff and exciting times lie ahead. And we learn so much about hyenas. I feel as though I learn something about them every time I see them. And I think, given that I go on leave and tomorrow's my last drive before a couple of days break, I think I might even plan to start the sun sunrise safari there tomorrow morning. That, of course, is entirely dependent on how the day itself goes and what's going to happen. And as you know, we cannot plan ahead. Who knows might, who might come wandering in. Tingana could come up from the south. Karula could come in from the east. And all manner of lions could come wandering in from any direction. It's the joys of live safaris, and you'll just have to tune in 
to find out exactly what the day will have in store in store for all of us. A big thank you to Brian for all of his fantastic camera work. Thank you, Brian, and for the pictures of the scorpions and all other magical contributions, as well as to Kirsty and Jerry, both for their final control directing, as well as for Jerry's fantastic contribution to my hairstyle this evening. Thank you, Jerry. It was a painstaking and very patient experience. I appreciate it. Thank you as well to Eugene for all of his technical work. And of course, as always, our biggest thank you goes to you guys, the viewers, for your contribution and your questions. We love having you on board. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world, and we'll catch up with you for the Sunrise Safari. Cheers for now.